Hey, Ty, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, good to see you. Good to see you as well. Oh, good to hear from you, actually. Yeah, oh, yeah I know. Right? <laughs> Let's see if I can get this louder. <clears throat> hey, Ty, I'm going to sign in under um, two computers uh, in case I need to project anything on my other computer. OK. Thanks. Good evening, Councilmember Bracco. Hi, Tam. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. It won't let me turn my camera on. It says you stopped it. Um, hmm. I did not, but I can certainly see if I can try to have it on. Yeah, it's saying the same for me too, Ty. Oh, yes. Me too. And me too. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it all says right. the I message started all the videos here. Okay. The, the message is you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Well, I am now allowed it. That's a, one of those weird things of Zoom. It's working now. Yes. There you go. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hello. Everybody. Hi, folks. Hello. I, I still have City of Gilroy on. I don't see it. I'm going to try to connect my audio to these little earbuds. So if I get, if I, if it doesn't work, I'll just connect normal. Council Member Marks, what do you see in your screen right now? I see City of Gilroy seal, City Council regular meeting, today's date. Oh, right. uh, why don't you double click on it and you'll see every, the whole view of everyone. Because oh, right I, now, there actually, you are. Okay. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Yes. So I just shared the screen just that everyone knows that they're in the right meeting. Okay. Yes. All righty. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Wait, what did you have to do? Because I'm having the same thing. I have that screen, and then I have all of us on the side. Just double cl double click on the screen, and it will minim you know like make it smaller so you can see the rest of the other screens. Hmm. That made it worse. Oh, yeah. quick view, I Marie. Have, I just have what? small pictures. Quick view. On the side. I can turn my Wait, screen you off. You go right to now. view and go side by side gallery. Oh, all right. That's where I was, side by side gallery. But now it's smaller than it was. Wait, full screen. Okay, that's where I was before. I thought, yeah, I thought you were saying we'd see everybody as a grid, but I just see everybody in one row on the right. Yeah. yeah. Same here. Okay. I can turn off my uh, share my screen at the moment right now. That way you can see the whole gallery. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> there we go there we go oh now this looks normal <laughs> good evening andy good evening hi it also seemed possible I, in that last view, there was a vertical line just to the left of the people's things, and you could drag that across and make the shared screen smaller. I never knew that before. I never noticed it and actually increased the size of the people. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. I never, never I somehow just experimented. <laughs> <laughs> All the wonderful things in Zoom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So we have five more minutes. Okay. Ty, when we get to the interim community development director appointment, can you let John Biggs in? John Biggs. Oh, yeah. of course. Uh, I'm not seeing him on the attendee list. Okay. Actually, I. Oh. You went to mute, Jimmy. Oh. I, I, I'll keep an eye out for him as well because I could let him in too, I guess. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You're already recording though, right? Yes. Okay. So we can st start at, at six on the dot. Very good. If you ever want to see a video of what can go wrong when, when being recorded before a council meeting, I believe it was uh, city north of Oakland. I can't remember what city it was, but yeah. school district. The school district thing, I know. <laughs> that'll, that'll make you cringe. Oh, I know. 
All right, I will go ahead and have my video uh, turned off. Okay. And also muted as well. Okay, yeah. Pai, you yeah. are going to display a flag though when that time comes, right? Yes. Okay. okay. That answers my question. Oh, and hello, Senator Laird. <laughs> hello. Good to see you. Is this like your green room before you, uh, you go on? Is that what's happening here? We're waiting for six o'clock, yeah, for the, for the actual start time. I don't know about you, I get a little nervous not logging on early enough just in case I'm going to have login problems. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, years and years ago when I was a mayor, which was many years ago, I was speaking to this veterans group and I show up and I think I've many a time and I open the door and they're halfway through an introduction of me. I had no idea if I'd have been a minute later, I'd have missed oh. <laughs> the whole thing. And so it always makes you nervous and want to be there. <laughs> All right, 5.58, we're getting there. Well, the yeah, governor but, listed, he lifted the mask mandate effective February 15th. Yay, yay, yay. Oh, okay. oh, Mayor Blank? Today. Six o'clock? Not yet. One more minute. Just okay. want to say that give me a few seconds when I put the flag up. Very good. Okay. Well, as you know, it'll take me a minute to read all the required reading I have to do. Yes. Mayor, I have six o'clock. Would you like to start? As do I. Yes, I would. All right. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, calling to order. I would like to state for the record that this meeting is being conducted by teleconference pursuant to enacted Assembly Bill 361. The city was previously complying with the Brown Act orders issued by the governor, which were aimed at containing the novel coronavirus and which expired on September 30th, 2021. This bill gives local agencies the authority to continue to host virtual meetings until January 1st, 2024, as long as California is under a governor declared state of emergency. In order to continue meetings subject to this exemption to the Brown Act, the city council must make findings by majority vote every 30 days that the current circumstances have been reconsidered and that the state of emergency continues to impact the ability of members and the public to meet safely in person or that state or local officials continue to impose or recommend social distancing measures. The city council will consider whether to make these findings at least every 30 days until the governor lifts the state of emergency. City Hall is open to the public during regular business hours, 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Monday through Thursday. The agenda states that the public may view the meeting that is being live streamed online via Zoom and Facebook Live. The public has the option of participating in tonight's meeting via Zoom and may provide public comment during the meeting using the raise your hand feature visible on your screen, or if you are calling in, press star nine. The Zoom call-in information was provided on the posted agenda, as well as on social media. All right, I'd like to start uh, the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I've asked Council Member Tovar to lead us in the pledge. Thank you, Mayor. 
Please stand. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. And for invocation, I believe Malcolm McPhail is here. Yes, I did see him. He is trying to connect through audio. We'll just try to give him a few seconds here. Oh, and he just logged off. Logged off? Yes, I think he has uh, internet issues okay. with his phone. Okay. Well, we thank you, Malcolm, for trying. All right, city clerk's report on posting the agenda and go ahead and go right into roll call. Yes, Madam Mayor, the agenda was posted on February 3rd, 2022 at 9.26 p.m. I'll go ahead and do the roll call. Council Member Armendariz? Here. Council Member Bracco? Here. Council Member Hilton? Here. Council Member uh, Lidro Munoz? Present. Council Member Marks? Here. Council Member Tovar? Here. And Mayor Blankley? Here. All right, before I move on, I want to say happy birthday to the three of us on the council who just had birth, well, two of us who had birthdays and one who's got one coming up. So council member Leroy Munoz was January 26th. I was February 4th and council member Hilton is on the 13th. So someday there's gonna be a law that says you can't have three Aquarians on the council, but we'll see. <laughs> so far, it's okay. <laughs> Happy birthday, everyone. Yeah, happy birthday, everyone. Happy birthday. Okay, under orders of the day, I, seeing none, I don't have any, we don't usually. Employee introductions, we have none. Ceremonial items, we have none. So that brings us to State Senator Laird, who's going to give us a 15-minute uh, update on the happenings in his office. Well, thank you very much. It, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm in my office in Sacramento. Uh, we were in session today. And uh, in the uh, recess, I was able to come by City Hall and meet with some of you, was at the Historical Society, had lunch with people downtown, did different things in downtown, and it was great. And normally, I am staffed by a Gilroy native on my staff, Justin Tran, who is not with us tonight because it's his birthday. <laughs> so uh, uh, he, I think, is eligible now to serve on the city council. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, he would have normally uh, been here. And it, when I have been reporting back to cities, and I have 21 cities in the Senate district, and I was in most of the city halls, if not all of them, by the end um, during the recess, uh, I've been looking back and, and we're almost to the point of looking forward uh, uh, totally, but just briefly last year, we had um, probably the largest budget surplus that uh, has happened in modern history in California. We had roughly $75 billion above projections. By the time we were done, half of that either was returned uh, to taxpayers in the term in, in terms of assistance for COVID and small business assistance, and then the rest of that half was put in reserves. The reserves uh, in California have grown to twenty five billion dollars, and the other half we use to address long term intractable problems, deal with uh, broadband across the state, and trying to bring more people into connectivity, um, child care slots, rates, and wages. We dealt with Medicaid. The age was dropped to 50. We added hundreds of thousands of students to student aid in the hope that we could get much closer to a debt-free college. Not a free college, but a, a, a debt-free college. We really tried to put uh, uh, additional funds, budget for impact on homelessness, and, uh, and then did things for housing in particular. So uh, uh, last year, that was a good year. Now, here we go, we have another surplus and 20 billion roughly will be taken right off for schools and another 5 billion roughly for reserves, which will leave about 20 million. And there's plenty of discussions. Today, we approved 
extending some of the programs for people to help them financially uh, through COVID. We did have a, a rental assistance program that has expired, although if people were eligible, they can still uh, uh, get money from that. And for me, it was a good year in the sense that uh, I chaired the Education Budget Subcommittee. Uh, we worked really hard on school reopening. We worked really hard on, on a major restoration of UC, CSU, and community colleges, and a major restoration of funding uh, through K through 12. And we are now, uh, tomorrow I have the third hearing of 10 hearings that we have over four and a half weeks on next year's education budget. And coincidentally, tomorrow morning, the two witnesses I will have at the hearing on the K through 12 budget will both be from the Gilroy Unified School District. So the two witnesses will be from Gilroy uh, tomorrow morning uh, in the budget. And last year, I had 10 bills signed into law. One was on fire planning and making sure we just didn't plan for fire prevention year to year that we did uh, uh, five years together. Uh, one, I got an award from the League of Cities because there was a one year a hiatus on the penalty for the implementation of the organics law uh, that cities and counties uh, uh, have to implement to divert organics from landfills. And that bill leveraged $70 million in the budget that will also be available for grants to the cities and counties uh, uh, to do that. And I also had a very difficult bill passed to facilitate the Pajaro River levee uh, project at the lower Pajaro. Uh, because it was, uh, there's going to be trouble coming up with the local share. So the state essentially bought out the local share. So the federal government and the state uh, government together will fund it. Right now, there's only five year flood protection through uh, the city of Watsonville. And um, when I was in the assembly, the editor of the Gilroy Dispatch would frequently send me letters reminding me that more of the upper Pajaro was in my district than the lower Pajaro. And I am conscious of that, but I think in the entire system, uh, this fits together. I'm looking toward this year. We still have two weeks to introduce bills, but I just set a record on Friday for the fastest bill through a session that's not a budget and the first one signed by the governor because the Watsonville Hospital has gone into bankruptcy. Uh, they sent layoff notices. They announced their intent to go out of business in December, it has ex been extended by the bankruptcy court to the end of March. So I had to bill through in just over two and a half weeks to create a hospital district. There's two more weeks to get a bid together from the hospital district. The bid has to be finalized by March 31st. And then the public can buy the hospital and keep it open in, in Watsonville. And we were, are working really hard uh, uh, to make that happen. We also had two tragic incidents in Santa Cruz County of uh, law enforcement killed in the line of duty. Three in the city or county of Santa Cruz have been killed in the last eight years. Well, two of them had spouses of many years and kids, two kids each, but they weren't legally married. The kids are not entitled to the same level of survivor benefits and the widows uh, uh, were not as well. So I have a bill to adjust this so that kids are not penalized by the status of their parents if their uh, father or mother is killed in the line of duty. And I have introduced that bill already to try to do that. And now we move into this year's process and I'm chairing a panel on climate change of, of uh, Senate Democrats to try to see if we can come to an agreement. I attended the the conference in Glasgow last November to see if we can get agreement on what the next steps are that we need to take to, to address climate. And I want to leave time for questions and answers. So one more hot topic, and that is the hot topic of redistricting. Um, I was elected in November of 2020 to represent my district through December of 2024. I will do that happily and proudly. And Gilroy is in the district till uh, December of 2024. But the Senate district that I represent moved a little south and east. So they're removing anything in Santa Clara County. 
they added San Benito County, Salinas to Salinas Valley. So the new district will have all of Santa Cruz County, all of San Benito County, all of Monterey County, and the Northern 81% of the population in San Luis Obispo County. So I will have Gilroy for another three years, but then it will pass to the district that's now represented by Senator Cortese. And I just wanted to assure you that I will represent you strongly and firmly for three more years. Uh, um, and it's gonna be hard to say no uh, to people from Gilroy, San Martin and Morgan Hill if they ask me to do things even after the lines have switched because I have represented pieces of that for, by then it will be 10 years in the legislature. So uh, that, believe it or not, is the Federal Express version of a report from Sacramento. And I would be happy to answer uh, any questions that any of you have on anything that's of interest uh, with regard to the state or state city relations. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you for that presentation. Thank you for being willing to be here to talk to us. Council members, does anyone have a question they would like to pose while the Senator is with us? Mayor? Yes, Council Member Tovar. Good evening, Senator Fred Tovar here. Good to see you again. Um, in regards to your last comment about, um, you know, in three years, you'll be representing a different district other than Gilroy. And I know Cortese, uh, Senator Cortese will be um, sort of representing us. I'm hoping that prior to your uh, departure that we can all meet together again with Senator Cortese and just sort of talk about the issues and get your input with, when we have that larger discussion. That way he's well aware of what sort of issues and some you know things that we're facing here in South County. I, I would happily do that. And uh, I have talked to him about it already. It's a transition that's off in the future, right. but I've worked on the flood control projects. Uh, I've been working on Anderson Dam. I've been working with the water district about the, the Cross Valley Canal. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm, been working in the past with Supervisor Wasserman about the Agland preservation and the conservation programs from the state and many, many other issues, housing for one, particularly in what the state has done to Morgan Hill with regard to their previous initiative. Uh, happy to, to make sure that that people are up to speed and they know exactly what's going on. on that yeah, and I would appreciate that. And again, I, I've met Senator Cortese several times, but given the uniqueness of South County, you know, it'd be nice to have a really large discussion with him prior and given, given your feedback and your input as well, um, just to make sure that your worry is not forgotten, you know, so I would appreciate that. Happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Armendariz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, nice to see you, Senator Lair. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering about the surplus money and the spending. Can you tell us specifically what kind of um, funding went to homeless services or if there's any, anything coming around the pike for, for homeless services? Because Gilroy is one of the most impacted cities in our county. Well, that's one place that I want to work with you a little because it's it, there was $12 billion appropriated over multiple years to be able to expand Project Home Key in some of the other uh, services that, that are being delivered. And the problem that exists is there's some places in my district where the homeless issue is disproportionate to the size. So, I mean, in Santa Cruz, the, um, the homeless population per capita is bigger than San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, Los Angeles, San Diego. Yeah. And yet the funding is on a per capita basis. So it doesn't come down the pike in a way that there can be budgeting for impact. And uh, uh, some of us are looking for ways to address that because it, it, it I mean, we, we have worked with Caltrans on issues in Gilroy and on issues in Monterey, and there's disproportionate populations in San Luis mm -hmm. Obispo and in Santa Cruz. And in some places, Monterey, Northern Monterey County is one. Some cities do services, some don't. And as a result, there's gravitation certain places based on the fact that there's absence of services in others. And we have to address that because the homeless issue among smaller cities, and believe me, it's smaller compared to Los Angeles or San Jose, not small cities in general. It is not working. And so right. I think that uh, right. uh, yeah, we're, we are one of those cities that has a disproportionate amount of 
of homeless per, per capita for our, for our county. So I want to continue yeah, to work. I'd with be happy you. to connect with your staff about that. Great. Thank you. And I'd like to say thank you for you've been your offices have been a big help with Caltrans to us. Thank you. I can attest to that myself. All right, Council Member Roman Yost. Well, Mayor, that's a, that's a perfect segue into what I was going to talk about. First off, Senator, it's always very good to see you. Uh, you know, one of the, the hot topics that is going on federally and, and certainly at the state level is around infrastructure. And in particular, uh, local roads here in Gilroy suffer from a, a very low level of our pavement condition index. And I just wanted to hear from you if you had any thoughts about either resources or support that the state might help uh, provide to cities. Because here in Gilroy, we're looking at about an annual cost of several million dollars just to maintain pace with where we are. And that's that's an unacceptable level where we are. But just curious about your thoughts on that. No, thank you for the question. It's good to see you. It's, it's always good to see somebody that's half Norwegian. Uh, um, the, the, uh, um, the thing, when I came and met with every mayor when I was running, I met with your then mayor who highlighted the state of Highway 152 through the city in Gilroy and the condition. I know there's been, been an upgrade, but it is happening all over. And I think the hard thing is, is that the, I worked for Jerry Brown for eight years. Jerry Brown stepped up and did the, the transportation measure. It provided, and it had to go to the voters to be sustained. It provided more money uh, uh, additionally for roads than has been done in three decades. And yet I still get questions like you just uh, uh, did because it still doesn't meet what the accumulated need is uh, uh, of it. And so we have been hoping that that we could guide some of the federal infrastructure money provided it actually comes to, to exactly this. And I think it also is true. It, it's, it's another one of those things that that the cost of roads compared to the population in smaller cities in California is a disproportionate hit to their budget. And that in certain counties where you have um, more rural areas, it is almost impossible to, to keep up. And so uh, I'm hearing about it all the time. We're putting it into the mix. We're hoping that this infrastructure money can help us make a dent in it. Because other than that, it's really about raising taxes. And we did it once and did it by the skin of our teeth. So we'll just have to see what we can get in the infrastructure bill. But thank thanks you for asking. Yeah, those are great questions. Thank you again for your presentation. We're right on time. That's perfect. So thank you for being here. My pleasure. I look forward to seeing you all soon. And I hope to see you in person sometime soon. No kidding. Okay. Thanks for having me tonight. Good night, good night. Okay, agenda item 3.2, uh, public comment. Uh, members of, this is for members of the public to comment on items not on the agenda, but within the subject matter jurisdiction of the city council. Um, anyone who wishes to comment uh, related to items not on the agenda, uh, please participate by, if you're participating by Zoom, um, use the raise your hand feature visible on your screen, or if you're calling in, press, Star nine. All right, I'd like to ask the city clerk if we have any public comments. Uh, there was one public comment that, that was written, uh, provided uh, written, uh, via email by Mercedes Chen and you were forwarded already. Uh, okay. I do not see any raised hands at this time, Mayor, Madam Mayor. None at all. Okay, then I will, seeing no audio comments, uh, the public comment period is now closed. Okay, reports uh, by council members. Council Member Bracco. Yes, I recently attended the Library uh, Joint Powers Authority and some good things to report. Um, our local library now is working with, or, or the, the county library is working with our youth task force to provide programs like the Godmothers and Late Night Gym. We also got a budget snapshot. Our, our library system is in excellent condition, as, as usually is. And we have been uh, made, we have a five-star rating, which puts us in the top five libraries in the United States. And 
That's it. All right, thank you. Council Member Armendariz. Uh, no report, thank you. All right, Council Member Marks. Uh, yes, I attended the Downtown Business Association meeting last week. And some good news is the farmer's market is thinking of relocating to downtown Gilroy starting end of March. And if you haven't been downtown yet to enjoy the benches, Jeff Orth has built 17 of them that have been placed around downtown. And also they had a lot of local artists get together and paint wine barrels that will be used as flower planters and they will shortly be distributed throughout downtown to make everything look so much nicer. On kind of a, a downside, we had talked about PG&E having downtown up and running by May at the latest, but there is a transformer issue. And unfortunately that has been delayed until August and maybe late September. So we're hoping for the best that this gets fixed real soon and everything is completed and our businesses can have power and be up and running. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor Blinkley. Um, from Visit Gilroy California Welcome Center, the Board of Directors unanimously approved proposals to complete the Visit Gilroy website ADA accessibility pertaining to events, calendars, and maps. The Board of Directors received a preliminary 2021 strategic market plan for, from Articulate Solutions detailing the results of the goals approved for the calendar year. All goals were surpassed significantly. Executive Director Howard will present a comprehensive report to the city council in early spring to share the outcome of the 2021 marketing plan in detail. The California Welcome Center reported to the board retail sales at the center for the month of December were more than 200% over budget goal. Walk-in visitors in December surpassed prior years by, by over a thousand visitors and total number of collateral distribution distributed during the month of December was over 1900 pieces. From Silicon Valley Clean Energy, I'm continuing to meet with SBCE staff regarding the progress of reach codes and current draft building codes for 2023 adoption um, that will include all electric new construction for residential and commercial, along with EV charging stations located in multifamily residential. SBCE is commi committed to staff, the technic to our staff, the technical assistance and partnership they provide during public outreach meetings, and they will provide $10,000 to cover the expenses just to bring the reach code up to a vote. The board approved the 2022 policy platform and six key focus areas for an ad hoc committee to address legislative and regulatory responses. The policy platform contains SVCE's overall advocacy strategy on both legislative and regulatory levels, including positions SVC will take on upcoming bills. And um, these are the protecting direct access, reliability planning and procurement, transparency and accountability and rate making, public, public safety power shutoffs, wildfire prevention and cost recovery, affordability and equity, de and decarbonization. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. Just uh, one announcement. Our, um, our gourmet alley slash downtown ad hoc committee um, has we've been um, we decided to delay our, our next meeting. We're in the process of uh, waiting to get findings of a grant they may help with the gourmet alley. So I think we're going to try and meet back up in March. So Corinne Decker has been working extremely hard on those grants. So we hope to have some good news that can assist us with the gourmet alley. That's it. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Leroman Yos. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A couple of weeks ago, the Valley Water District had its meeting. I'm our city representative for that. And so I sit on the commission. I attended that meeting. We received an update on the status of the, uh, the drought. And, and yes, it, it looks from all intents and purposes to be a drought where we are currently, despite the rain that we received at the end of December and the early part of the new year, much of that rain actually seeped just right into the soil and not a whole lot of it got into uh, the reservoirs, which are currently at 27% of their capacity. And unfortunately, the long-term perspective for rain in our region doesn't look all that great for the next, uh, next little bit of time. So uh, Valley Water encourages people to maintain good water uh, discipline. I'm happy to report that when the request was made at the end of last year to help reduce uh, water use in our county, we actually reduced it 15% for 
from our 2019 level. So kudos to everybody for helping to reduce water usage. Um, I will also say with regard to the water district that they will be considering rate changes at their April meeting coming up. Uh, the commission was able to provide feedback on this and I shared our perspective that Gilroy is in a different place economically than most other places of the county to the north of us. Additionally, we are the location for the only real substantial agriculture that goes on in our county. So I was very clear to remind them of that and to be cognizant of that as they make any decisions relative to uh, rate changes at all. So whether that happens or not, we'll wait to see, uh, but at least I put it out there for their consideration. That's all I have, Madam Mayor, thank you. Thank you. That's gonna lead into my report too. I didn't know if council members Bracco or Tovar would talk about our scraw board meeting. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about that. I did have a VTA board meeting as well last week, nothing specific to Gilroy to report, but at scraw, you know, the primary source of drinking water in the cities of Gilroy and Morgan Hill is the Yagas sub basin. And recycling water is something that is already underway at Scraw. Purifying water is something we're working towards, but recycling water is something we do. And anytime we recycle water, we preserve the drinking water that's in the basin. So just a few facts I, I wanna share. Uh, Scraw's recycled water system supported nearly 850 million gallons of water for our communities in 2021. And on an average, at, on an annual average, that means 38% of 2.2 billion gallons of water received by the Scraw facility was treated and used as recycled water. To appreciate uh, Scraw's intake, the, the, the sewage, water, everything that goes into Scraw, 55% of all of its intake comes from the city of Gilroy, 45% comes from the city of Morgan Hill. And given that 38% was the annual average of wastewater treated, it's almost as though every bit of water that came from the city of Morgan Hill, smaller than Gilroy, actually resulted then in recycled water. And the other, the bottom line is, according to, anyway, projections in the Gilroy Urban Water Management Plan, this recycling is estimated to be about 16% of the water demand by our two cities. So in other words, you could say that 16% of the sub-basin drinking water was preserved by all the recycling efforts that happen. So some things to, to be proud of, um, even though water purification is still something on the horizon. I also wanna mention that our, you know, our council retreat next week, I'm really saying this for the public because all council members know about it. We all uh, participated in how we chose the date, a date being that everybody could make. Um, that workshop we're gonna do uh, February 15th, and it's going to address how, how do we as a council respect that the people's business be conducted openly? How do we allow for all members of the public to speak on items on or off the agenda? And what are some of the behaviors that undermine the public's right to witness all information that goes into council deliberations? So things along those lines will be what we, uh, some of the things anyway, that we try to address next week. And that is my report. Okay, so moving on to future council initiated agenda items. Do we have any? Yes, uh, Madam Mayor, I wanted to make one if I could. Sure. Uh, mine was going to be for the city to consider an ordinance that would prohibit the use of plywood on windows in uh, buildings in the downtown area. Okay, a, a downtown area being first to 10th, being fourth to, do you know, have you? Uh, th that, that, those kind of details can be kind of worked out, but just kind of the main thoroughfare along uh, along Monterey. Uh, specifically, the, the rationale that I have there, I don't want to go too far into it, but the rationale is that uh, in terms of the visual appearance uh, of the building, sometimes downtown, we see that there, there are businesses that will simply put a plywood in windows for businesses that are not currently open to the public. And it just creates a it doesn't create the proper image that we would like to convey to consumers, to residents, to visitors, whomever. So mm -hmm. uh, that would be the the uh, change that I would uh, I would put forth for consideration. Okay. So, Mayor, can I ask a follow up question? Yeah, Andy, you yeah. stop us if we go yeah. too far because I never know where that line is. Okay, go ahead. Peter, no, I, I think uh, the mayor had, had just mentioned something. I think um, you know, sort of. This ordinance, it would be nice to have it from First to Tenth Street because there are businesses along First Street that you know all the way down that um, 
either have plywood or just have not been taking care of their buildings. It'd be nice to have that throughout downtown. That's just my suggestion. Okay, I'm, I'm not quite clear on that. I was talking Monterey Street between, I was asking between 1st and 10th on Monterey. Is that what you meant to? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, that's okay. right. First, yeah, first, yeah, yeah, then, then, yeah, let's use that as the boundary, 1st to 10th. Fine, okay. Um, Jimmy, is, is it okay to ask Jimmy if that's an issue for staff before we all do a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Yeah, Madam Mayor, what I would, I would want to explain to Council is what we envision when you ask us a, a something like that, is that we agendize an item that is a, a very short staff report that introduces maybe some of the options and, and what the current practice is, and then you as a group can decide if we want to go further into developing a, a written ordinance or, or how that fits into the, you know, the things that the city is working in at the time. Very good. I see a hand by Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, Council Member Loromenos, were you aware of the the window covering that already exists in the downtown area? That that ordinance, I believe it's five A. I don't know the language right in front of me, but if not, maybe staff can at least address that because that is something that that is currently enforceable right now. Yeah, wind, window coverings are are fine as long as it's not plywood. I, I'm specifically interested in plywood, and if there's something, if there's already an ordinance that fully addresses plywood, then that's fine. But I, I would just ask staff to look at that as an option. I, I want to make sure that that is removed as an option. Okay. Well, then what, oh, Council Member, do you have a question specific to what he's saying? Or I, should we go ahead? Okay. Mm -hmm. I have Council a question. Uh, Council Member Loromanos, would this be an ordinance um, that would apply to businesses that experience vandalism, right? Like as a a temporary needed as something temporary or would this be a blanket ordinance for any incident where a window <clears throat> covering is needed? Yeah, I, I would leave that to staff's discretion to identify exceptions, but I, I think that sounds like on a short short term basis for a security issue for, you know, a day, 24 hours, whatever it is. Yeah, that, that seems like an acceptable uh, exception. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So Right, so all that is what would come of putting this on the agenda, discussing all those kinds of things. So uh, why don't, can everybody show me a thumbs up or a thumbs down for putting this on the agenda? And I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven thumbs up. So Jimmy, there you go. All right, moving on to- Here, oops, oh, sorry. sorry. Yes. Yeah, no, I have another one. And I, I know I had this discussion with, um, with Jimmy, but I, I, and forgive me, Jimmy, if, if it's already going to be on agendized, but uh, I would like to have a presentation done by the Garlic Festival Association and giving us an update because, as you know, that's right around the corner. And, I, it, and as you guys know, there's a long history of that and whatever we can do to assist or whatever their direction is, it'd be nice to have that discussion and see where they're at. So hoping we can agenda it sooner than later. I think what we... My recollection, council member, is that we were going to have a presentation by the Garlic Festival Association. Was that not correct? I'm, I'm trying to remember. I, I believe we were. I just wanted to make 100% sure. Yeah, we're supposed to have a presentation from them to let, let us know where they are and what, what they, yeah, if there's something they think the city can do. Um, Jimmy, is that in accordance with what you remember or do you not want to comment? No, that is what I remember. We did extend an invitation to them to provide us a date when they would like to come back to council, but they haven't provided us a date yet. So okay. we can reach out again. All right. Perfect. Thank okay. you. And, and we have met with them too offline too. I know Jimmy and Leanne both and I. Okay. All right. Item six, the consent calendar. Um, I'm asking council members if, if anybody wishes to remove anything from consent. Mayor, I would like to pull 6.2 because I think it has to be discussed and some questions asked. Okay, so 6.2 is being pulled. So can I have a motion? Uh, that only leaves 6.1. So would anyone like to make a motion to approve 6.1? I'll, I'll move approval 6.1. And a second? I'll second. Okay, okay. Council Member Marks seconded. So Council Member Loromanios made the motion. Council Member Marks seconded it. And we need a roll call vote for 6.1. Council Member Amadeus? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Lee Ramunos? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. Okay, so item 6.2, 
That's the uh, resolution of the City Council of the City of Gilroy making required findings to allow the continuation of remotely held meetings for the next 30 days. So uh, I will, you know, I don't think I opened for public comment even on the last thing that we said. So maybe I should go to the public first. <laughs> Um, do we have any public comment? Uh, if, if you would like to comment on anything on the consent calendar, uh, please, um, if you're using Zoom, use the raise your hand feature. If you're calling in, press star nine. Um, City Clerk, do we have anybody wanting to speak? Uh, yes, I have one individual in the, okay. in the attendee, uh, Kristen Brown. Okay. Go ahead, please. Hi, um, City Council members. Um, I did. I came in a little late, so I apologize if I'm not on topic. But I was came to my attention that you guys were going to address the opening of Christopher High. Um, oh, that's the Christopher High Aquatic Center. Okay. Can you? We haven't gotten to that item yet. Okay. Okay. Good. So okay. You can save your. Yeah, you're not late. You can save your comment. That will be agenda item seven point two. We're still okay. on six. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Okay. All right. Are Bye. there any others? I see no others, Madam Mayor. Okay. So I'm closing public comment on the consent calendar and going back to six point two. Uh, Council Member Marks, do you want to start? Uh, sure, Jimmy. In light of what was on the news tonight about. Of uh, the governor lifting um, on February 15th. How does that affect 6.2? Does that how does that affect us in doing Zoom meetings? Well, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to answer that right now. I have not read the order. Um, I just heard about it uh, a little bit ago. I'd have to consult with the city attorney and also with the county uh, situation. Uh, but I could. Um, it's certainly something we'll look at because you know as we want to get back in person as, as quickly as possible too. All right, thank you. If I may add, I, uh, uh, Councilor Marks from the chair, I, I believe that the, the the virtual meeting provision that we're relying on still would survive. Although I haven't read the order either, we'll have to look at it. But I don't think it uh, vitiates the ability of cities to do these virtual meetings pursuant to AB 361. But we'll find out for sure. So in other words, if we're able to meet at the end of February, then if we vote yes on this, we still would be able to? Or if we vote yes on this, does this lock us in until end of March? No, this doesn't lock us in. Okay. This allows us to do virtual meetings. But as soon as we're able to get off virtual meetings, we will, right? If the council chooses to do that, yeah. yes. I think it's it's a catch-22 because this doesn't as he doesn't lock us in, but since the council has to make that decision, you can't make that decision until the next council meeting. Right. So by yeah. passing this here, we're going to be, we're virtual today and we're gonna be virtual on the 28th. Mm -hmm. What the governor just passed, um, number one, doesn't, doesn't necessarily change any Santa Clara County law. It's just state, and it just says you don't have to wear masks indoors if you're vaccinated. So even in our case, that that would then ask the question: Well, are we going to ask for proof of vaccination when people come in? You know, it kind of if if you were concerned about the virus still. So and, and and unfortunately, under AB three sixty one that we're operating under, um, you ha you have to renew the you have to renew the authorization every thirty days, which is really foolish. Actually, it's, a, it's a, a silly thing to have to do, but that's why it's on the agenda. And many cities that are doing this simply put it on the consent calendar each month with the expectation that eventually they'll go back to normal meetings, of course. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. We just, we can't tell, how, I'll make one comment. I don't see any, uh, anybody else's hands. We can't tell how many members of the public, you know, come to meetings and it gets harder to space everybody out when there is still a concern with the virus. So we want to make sure that we're, being safe at our at our retreat that we're having next week, there's not an expectation of a lot of people attending because there aren't agenda items like usual for, for the public. That doesn't mean they won't, and then we'll have to address that if it hap if anything happens that we can't control spacing. But for now, that's what this this is allowing us to meet virtually, absent a, a future council decision to no longer meet virtually. So 
with that, I already asked for public comment on the consent calendar, so that included both. So is there, uh, does anyone want to make a motion on item 6.2? I'll so make move. a move, move, excuse me, I'll move to approve item two. Thank you. Second. Third. Second, second. Okay, so I heard, motion was made by Council Member Laromanios. I heard the second first from Council Member Tovar, and this requires a roll call vote. Council Member Amadaris? Yes. Council Member Bracco? No. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Lira Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? No. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes. Okay, so that passed five to two. All right, item seven, bids and proposals. Approval of an agreement with Park Consulting Group for a not to exceed amount of $284,000 for EnerGov LMS professional services. And Cindy is going to be giving us the staff report. Hi, Cindy. Hi, good evening, everyone. In April 2018, the City Council awarded a contract to SDI Presence to assist the city in selecting and managing implementation of an LMS land management system, including successful rollout of the system to the public. The LMS rollout had an estimated go live date by the end of 2021. However, the project still has a significant number of outstanding action items. Given these delays and with the expiration of SDI's contract, staff met with two other firms and signed a limited contract with Park Consulting Group in November to evaluate the issues causing the delay and advise the city on how to get back on track to system rollout. After working with Park Consulting, it was evident that they would be a better fit for the city's needs, including but not limited to their direct experience implementing the Tyler Tech InterGov system for over 20 clients. Glenn Park, who is available this evening to answer any questions, would manage the project and work with staff to address any issues that might cause further delay. The LMS is expected to go live in the October, November timeframe, but no later than the end of this year with this contract. Therefore, staff is recommending that the city council award a contract to Park Consulting Group in the amount of $284,000 for the scope of work included in your packet. This concludes my report and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Cindy. All right, uh, council, uh, I'll go Madam to Mayor. Oh, yes. Madam Mayor, I would like to point out that this contract is not new money that we're asking for. It is savings from the ERP and other contracts that we used for implementation. So we're essentially taking savings that we had and using it for this additional consultant. So uh, no new money. Uh, we are still within budget, and so we're not asking for that appropriation tonight. We're only asking for approval of the contract. And was there any problem with the previous user? Or uh, there, essentially, what had happened is that the term with the particular vendor expired December thirty first, and um, an analysis was made that it, it would be better to expend the funds with a different contractor who's done many more of these and actually identified some of the issues we have. So. Um, I wouldn't say there was problems. I would just say we think this vendor is better suited for the LMS. Um, the vendor that previously did the LMS is the one that helped us with the ERP, and we had success in that program, but we feel with the LMS and where it's at, this uh, new consultant could do a better job. All right, thank you. Okay, so going to council, council member Tovar, I see thank your you. hand. Thank you, Mayor. And I think um, the city administrator sort of answered part of my question, but, um, I guess, Cindy, my question is in regards to this consulting, because I think we had a discussion a while back ago to try and see if we can reduce as many, reduce as many consulting companies as possible, because obviously it's quite a big strain on our, um, our, you know, our city budget. But I understand there's some that we can't do without. But in regards to this one here, these was there an RFP or RFQ sent out when we before we decided on this company? I asked that question because Again, and you guys have heard me say for six years, I mean, these folks are out in Irvine down south. And I'm just what, curious if there wasn't someone else on the list that was, you know, local. So um, I guess those are my questions. There was not an RFP uh, because we're not seeking new funding. Okay. We did consult with two consultants and um, we did a limited, as I mentioned, a limited contract with Park Consulting just to test them out. 
and we were satisfied with um, them as the consultant to help us out. Okay, but that doesn't answer my my follow up question yeah. in regards to, again, you know, I'm going to say it over and over until the day I die about local business, and for me, this is not local business. So, I mean, I'm just curious of what was there not another company that we could have gone with that um was much local than what this company is. So yes, yeah, so we did interview a CSG, which is already on our consultant list to help us out with our planning um, department and also building uh, permits. And uh, we just felt that Park Consultant had a um, better um, better uh, understanding of the Tyler Tech InterGov system. Actually, let, I could try to assist uh, Mr. Tovar. There is no local vendor for this type okay. of work. Uh, really, the local vendor is in the state of California. These are kinds of projects that we would get RFP responses from all over the country. And so I, I know I know you. we would love to have somebody at Gilroy or San Jose, but the vendors are not there for this type of work. That answers my question. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, Council, before I go to public comment? Okay. Then um, moving to public comment, this is the time for public portion of the meeting. Um, if you are participating in tonight's meeting via Zoom, please use the raise your hand feature visible on your screen, or if you are calling in, press star nine. So at this time, I'll ask the city clerk whether there are any public comments. I did not receive any written co public comments, nor do I see, uh, I do see one raised hand. Okay. Uh, Eric Howard. Okay, you have three minutes. Go ahead, please. Eric, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Um, and I can comment on the flag issue? No, this is agenda item 7.1. My apologies, You're... I'll wait. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, sorry about that. That's okay. Okay, are there any other comments? I do not see any other raised hands. Okay, thank you. So with that then, I'm seeing no other audio comments. Public comment is now closed. So, uh, Either more discussion or possible action if anybody's ready to make a motion. Nobody's speaking. Okay, also I'll move. I'll, I'll second <laughs> approval. <laughs> okay, we have a motion by Council Member Marks, seconded by Council Member Leroy Munoz to approve the professional services agreement with Park Consulting Group. Correct. Um, that would be a roll call vote. Council Member Armanderas? Yes. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Aye. Councilmember Libro Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. Okay, item 7.2 Award of a contract to Swimming Swan LLC in the amount of $358,750 to serve as the Christopher High School Aquatic Center Operator in 2022 and 2023. This is project number 22-RFP-AD-463. So we'll start with the staff report by Adam Hennig, Recreation Manager. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council members. My name is Adam Hennig, Recreation Manager. I will present about the award of the contract to Swimming Swan LLC. To serve as the Christopher High School Aquatic Center Operator in 2022 and 23. Beginning in 2012, the Recreation Department operated a seasonal swim program at the Aquatic Center. Services included swimming lessons, recreation swim, certification classes for lifeguarding, water aerobics, and a private party rental. Each summer, approximately 1,000 youth registered for swim lessons and more than 10,000 people participated participated in recreation swim. Due to the pandemic related reductions of recreational services, the pool had been closed to the public. To reopen the center and offer residents swim lessons and recreation swim, a request for proposal was initiated for the services of an aquatics operator. Submitted proposals were to include a vendor's operation experience, qualifications, and their approach to aquatics. Vendors were also required to demonstrate how they would ensure their fees were comparable to what neighboring communities charged and provide an option for those with an economic hardship to receive a scholarship or discount for swim lessons. 
The RFP was released on August 26, 2021. While there was interest from potential vendors, only two incomplete proposals were submitted. When staff followed up with the vendors who had expressed interest but had not submitted a proposal, their response was that it lacked a management fee. Even though the city would allow vendors to retain all revenue collected, which included swim lessons and admission fees, there were no other opportunities to generate revenue, making it financially unfeasible, according to the vendors. To attract more submittals, the RFP deadline was extended with an option to request a management fee, resulting in three completed submittals. Among them, only one met the minimum qualifications to move on to an interview with the selection committee which comprised of city and school district staff. The committee recommended Swimming Swan LLC, which also had the support of GUSD. Based in San Diego, Swimming Swan LLC was established in 2014. They offer individual and group swim lessons for all ages and all levels, as well as provide lifeguard training and management for community recreation swim. Their aquatic experience is focused on servicing homeowner associations and hotels in Southern California and Nevada. The vendor can also uh, offer a variety of program options, including swim lessons, lifeguarding and water safety, instructor certification, water therapy, aqua yoga, and junior lifeguarding. They manage their operations through a software platform that allows users to create an account and register in advance, making it accessible to the public. Swimming Swan plans to offer a robust summer program similar to what was previously offered by the Recreation Department. The president, Melissa Swanson, will be speaking uh, more about it shortly. The two-year agreement requires a management fee paid to the operator of $175,000 per year, with year two incorporating an inflation increase of up to 5%. The operator will oversee recruiting, hiring, onboarding, and training lifeguards and cashiers, as well as providing janitorial support. The city will be responsible for all building maintenance, capital improvement, utilities, water slide waxing and maintenance, and serve as a liaison between the school district and the contractor. The proposed agreement is for two years with an option to renew in year three. The need for access to a public swimming pool is high in Gilroy. In fact, in the 2020 facility and program needs assessment, access to a public swimming pool ranked as highest unmet need for households in Gilroy. In addition, having an outside operator provides a cost savings opportunity. To operate a city-run aquatics program for one summer that offers lessons in recreation swimming, it costs approximately $403,000. To contract out this service to Swimming Swan LLC, the city's net savings would be approximately $150,000 annually. This concludes my report. I'd like to turn it over to Swimming Swan founder and president, Melissa Swanson, who will share with you more about the services her company plans to provide the residents of Gilroy. And then we would be happy to answer any questions. Melissa? Thank you, Adam. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, let me, well, hello there. Uh, can you see me? Yes, <clears throat> okay. I can see you and hear you. <laughs> well, hello there. Uh, my name is Melissa Swanson and I am the president of the Swimming Swan. Uh, I thank you for your time this evening and for considering us to uh, <clears throat> reopen and operate uh, Christopher High School Aquatic Center. Uh, to give you a little bit on my background, I am a lifelong swimmer and professional uh, aquatic professional with over 20 years experience. Um, over the last eight years, uh, we have grown our services to include a variety of programming at uh, HOA community associations, as Adam has mentioned, and resort casinos, um, helping them with their lifeguard management services. Uh, currently, our team consists of five managers one regional director and one HR professional. So we are ready to go for Gilroy. Um, we are very excited about opening this pool. A few services that we are hoping to bring are learn to swim programming for children uh, six months to 12 years of age, uh, adaptive aquatics, uh, aqua fitness, 
safety training and certification classes. Uh, what else? Let's see, pool party rentals and concessions and just overall, you know, management of the facility. Um, what makes us different? I would say we are, uh, we have the manpower to get this going. Uh, we have a, a robust technology platform, as Adam mentioned, and we are up to date on the industry best practices and standards of care. Um, that's about it. We are very excited. I'm very humbled to present to you guys and uh, happy birthday to the fellow Aquarians here as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, Adam, may I ask the effective dates? I know this is for 2022 and 2023, but specifically what, what dates are, would the pool be open? Just to remind us all since it's been so long. That's a great question. So it would start uh, in early June um, and it would actually run until um, mid-August, which is when school starts. But then on the weekends, we would be able to offer recreation swim up and through uh, October through like the end of October, the beginning of October, or that's not defined? Uh, uh, most likely the end of October, that is the plan. Wow, very good. And lastly, was the YMCA considered? And I ask that only because, just so that uh, Melissa, you know, they operate Morgan Hills facilities. And so I'm just curious, uh, were they considered in, in, in this for Gilroy? Yes, they were. And they, okay. Okay, I guess I'll leave it at that then. When I right. mean, sorry, can we get more of an explanation on that? Because I, I mean, I guess okay. that's my question too. So, uh, <laughs> go ahead, Adam. You want to, yeah, tell tell us what uh, YMCA right, so is the YMCA, local. We all know them, yeah. So, so the YMCA had expressed interest. Um, they attended the walkthrough on the job site. Uh, they had actually also um, submitted a. Um, a proposal, although it, it wasn't completed. Uh, when staff followed up, they decided to rescind the proposal. Um, they just they just didn't want to move forward in the uh, process. Okay, yeah, no, I I believe you. I know I've I've talked to some there, and they just it wasn't for them. But I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that they they were considered. Okay, I'm going to go to council, but I, I know Fred. I see your hand up, but I, I thought I saw Councilmember Armendariz's hand up first, and then I don't know between Councilmember Hilton and Bracco who is next. So I, I might just go down the line. You're all in a row on my screen. Okay, go ahead, Councilmember Armendariz. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for asking about the why. It was on my mind too. Um, I know they do a good job with the local, other local facilities. So um, I didn't catch your name from, from Swan Swimming. Melissa Swanson. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks for coming. Sure. Yes. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'll start with uh, the big question that I have. I noticed that in the proposal that there is, inform um, there is mention of a scholarships and reduced rates available for families that uh, qualify in terms of income, but um, it's my understanding that, that that those are provided as a result of a grant that you received from the Red Cross. Is that true? That is correct. Yes, Red Cross is among one of the uh, providers that I've reached out to. Uh, we are in line to get the Centennial program. They are waiting to hear if we are awarded this prior to uh, giving the grant, but I am um, speaking to a couple of different uh, organizations as well. Mm -hmm. And how long would the Red Cross uh, grant, how many years is that? From my understanding, it's an annual grant and it's based on participation numbers and um, you know meeting certain metrics. So that's where we are. Okay, and so if, um, so would it be available uh, from the, from this year or from June, or would it be available after you've been in operation for a year? Is it based on metrics from previous years that we've operated? Well, the extension is based on metrics, but from my understanding, I have given them the proposal uh, based on 800 to 1,000 participants in our Learn to Swim, and I am talking to them about grants for 2022. Okay, so it's um, that, that funding is specific for Learn to Swim um, um, program or services. Yes. Not for folks who want to get, what do you have available then for, um, 
families um, who want to apply for the pass for the summer pass or who can't afford, you know, the, the $10 entrance fee every day. That's a good question. For the the pass, we can potentially provide uh, an incentive for that as well. We, for the grant funding, we're going to have an application process. So I can open that up to other services as well. Um, I would have to cap that at a percentage. Um, that is something I can do. Yes. Okay. Because I, um... You know, in, in thinking about grants and stuff, I know that they, you know, if they're annual, especially if they're not multi-year grants and the funding runs out, I'm wondering what type of uh, plan do you have to help uh, other families that, you know, who, who wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be able to get funding from the grant if the money ran out or if you weren't granted the, the amount that you're applying for? Well, there are, uh, there's the USSA um, Association, United States Swim School. They have a grant that we're applying for. Um, there's also USA Swimming. I'm applying for a grant for them as well. And um, from, we have a very good working relationship with the American Red Cross. And um, I am almost certain that we're going to receive funding for this. Um, if we do not, um, I have, other means. I'm thinking about fundraisers that our staff can provide out to the public um, that, you know, can incentivize some of these grant programs. Okay. Well, it, it's good to hear that that um, you have plan B and C and D in place and that it, it sounds like it's something. Okay. okay. That's something because it is, you know, a, a priority. Our, our community isn't um, all wealthy, you know, or able to afford these things. And, um, we received a lot of feedback from the public about really wanting to move forward and open Christopher. And so I want to make sure that it's available to all of uh, the members of our community. So I appreciate this being uh, sure. important for you. Thank you. Yes, it is. Thank you. Council member Bracco. Yeah, this is for Adam. Um, Adam, who will get the revenue from the swimming lessons and the use of the place? The operator. So in operator? the original the operator, so the contractor. In the original RFP, we had it so that they would collect 100% of the revenues. That would include swim lessons, that would include uh, recreation admission fees, that would include private party rentals. And we still only received two submittals and they were both incomplete. It, it still wasn't, according to the, all of the vendors that we reached out to who had expressed interest, it just wasn't financially uh, lucrative enough for them to uh, to want to submit a proposal. And then once we added the management fee, it then made it much more palatable. And that's when we received completed submittals. How, how much do, how much have we brought in in the past uh, on the revenue? Uh, between all those things I listed, about $160,000. But Anna, I'm sorry, and do you mean net net revenue or gross revenue? Oh, so, so so that's just revenue that we collected. But keep in mind, it costs over four hundred thousand dollars. Just exactly, to, uh, that's the point I want you to make sure is clear. And, okay. and that's where the that's where the the cost savings comes in. Um, yes, we we won't be collecting the revenue, but we don't have the overhead and the wages and all of the other costs that are incurred when you're running a city run aquatics program. So so you're you're telling me that we were spending a hundred four hundred and two thousand dollars a year. Because I've never, as long as I've been on the council, I have never heard that figure. 403. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that includes full-time wages, part-time wages. That includes overhead. Uh, there's also sunk costs involved with, with a pool. So you, you have facility fees. You have maintenance. Those are well, we're, we're still going to be paying that. That's correct. So you're not even. So, have, so you're not giving us the real picture. So if you deduct those those fees, the facility and the maintenance, it still comes out to three hundred twenty four thousand dollars. OK, to thank run you. a city run. Yeah, thank you. Adam, that's I'm, I'm going to Council Member Hilton next, but I want to clarify there. That's in in total. You're saying that it's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars less in cost when you take. Right. That's what you said in your report. That's correct. It's okay. Total expense, right. That's savings in considering the fact that we still have to maintain the pool. We just in our last meeting approved that contract to fix the pool, fix the plaster of the pool. Okay, Councilmember Hilton. 
Thank you, Mary Blankley. Thank you, Melissa, for being here tonight. Adam, awesome report. Um, Melissa, I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, have there been any wage theft complaints against Swimming Swan LLC since you've been owner? Wage theft complaints. Um, or that's any wage theft? No. Okay. Um, number two is, can you can you and Adam sort of talk about the um, the way that you're going to try to encourage the youth to apply for these lifeguard jobs? Um, is there a plan in place for that? Because you know, when we held this through the city for years, this was a great learning opportunity for those folks to work for city government um, and get employed by those jobs. Can you just briefly maybe talk about the the plan and what how, how we can help um, support that too? So let me let me just jump in real quick, Melissa, and then you can you can. Um come after me. So her, uh, Melissa and I have spoken about this and we are going to uh, use our, utilize our own marketing efforts because we want to obviously uh, create those local job opportunities uh, for uh, teenagers, uh, students who are coming home from college uh, and so forth for those in the, in the Gilroy area. Um, and so that would mean, you know, using our, our digital platforms, you know, such as Facebook, uh, our newsletter, um, you know, sending out uh, information to those who have done it in the past um, and who still reside in the area and so forth. Melissa, did you want to add to that? Absolutely, yes. So a part of the RFP was to uh, ask for access to the pool beginning spring break in April. And my goal with our um, Santa Clara uh, County Manager is to be able to provide as many training certifications that we can. We have uh, asked to use the pool every weekend to provide training. Uh, thus far, I am um, going to be offered paid training to our employees that want to come on board with us. Uh, not only will we pay for their certifications, but we will pay them to participate. And then we will, um, you know, with all hopes, right, that they'll want to come and work for us. Awesome. Yeah, I want to be able to help um, help share that. Um, the last question I have is just as you as you get in more into this contract, if you start hearing from folks from Gilroy that, like, let's say, are commuters that you know want to do a uh, lap swim maybe when they get home from work at night and it's outside the regular um, hours of twelve to five. Do you have, are you open or are you flexible to, to changing hours around if you find that there's an overwhelming amount and you could, you know, essentially operate um, for either early morning or, or late in the evening swim? Absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, after this meeting, uh, we do have the ability to go back and add to the schedule. And um, I'm already thinking about ways to do that to increase participation and, um, you know, really get the entire community involved. There's some some things that we can do that are uh, like safety training classes that are not specific to aquatics that we could uh, provide at the pool to, you know, for various programs. So yeah, I'm open to it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Council Member Tovar. Thank you. And uh, Melissa, thank you for being here. And then Adam, great report. And I'm excited to hopefully this will pass because our community needs it. But I have a few questions. Um, Melissa, you, you're based out of where? I uh, currently am in San Diego. That's where your company is based out of, right? It is, yes. Yeah, and, and I see you've done a, um, projects in hotels, homeowners association in California and um, Nevada, right? Correct. Okay, just wanted to get that, um, that background. Adam, leading your report on sort of the RFP, um, it states that, you know, you gave vendors four and a half weeks and during um, that time, um, you, you say there was, there was interest from potential vendors, only two incomplete proposals were submitted. Do you mean incomplete or you mean complete proposals? So we only received two submissions, but they okay. weren't completed. Got it. Okay. And then you say the reason was being is because um, um, the lack of a base management fee, correct? And then you say, well, to, to encourage that, then we implemented a management fee, correct? correct? Even with all of that there, we only had one complete applicant? No, we had three completed applications. The, the other two applicants did not meet the minimum qualifications. Okay. And take me through what some of the minimum qualifications were. 
Sorry. Again, Melissa, it has nothing to do with your company. Not at all. Uh, you know, again, if it, if it passes, I'm going to be 110% supportive, but I'm going to go back to my broken record, local, local business. So I'm just curious okay. what happened here. Yes. So, so it, it comes in, it comes about in terms of, of the amount of experience. Do, do they have operational aquatics operational experience? It's one thing to run a, 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 a um, you know, a, a swim team uh, or, or to, uh, you know, be a lifeguard in terms of, in your overseeing lap swim, but it's another to actually run a recreational swim community-based program. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, for example, you know, it, in terms of ha hiring lifeguards, training lifeguards, uh, in terms of knowing what all of the rules and the labor policies are, uh, and the laws that, in terms of regulate water slide usage, um, you know, swimming pools, uh, in terms of the types of chlorine, having just all of that know-how. This is a, a very high-risk uh, uh, program, and so so we don't take it lightly. And what we found were that with the other applications just did not pass muster. Um, again, there was a selection committee comprised of members of city staff, as well as Gilroy Unified School District. All right, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Okay, before I go to council members a second time, I'd like to go to the public. So um, this is, I know there are lots of, that we've gotten a lot of public comment, and I would like to let the public know that this is the time. If you're here for agenda item 7.2, which is the swimming contract to open the Christopher High Pool for aquatics this summer, now is the time for you to, uh, to participate in tonight's meeting via Zoom. If that's the way you're participating, then please use the raise your hand feature visible on your screen. Or if you are calling in, press star nine. Uh, I'd like to ask the city clerk if we have any public comments. Yes, we do, Madam Mayor. We had two written public comments from Mary Yates and Adrienne Rodriguez. And I see uh, four raised hands at the moment. I'll start with Kat Tucker. Okay. Go ahead, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You have three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I want to thank staff for such a thorough search. I think this is an excellent idea to um, have someone who has that expertise level to run this program because I don't know what it would cost if you had to hire full time staff to run every aspect of this type of program. It would cost a lot more, I would think. So thank you um, to staff and I, I urge all of you to please support this. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Next speaker is Kristen Brown. Just give me one moment so mm -hmm. I can uh, reset this. Yeah. Kat Tucker, go ahead, please. Kristen. Kristen. Yeah, oh, yeah. It, yeah oh, I just sorry. talked. Yeah, <laughs> Kat just spoke. So this would be All Kristen right. now. All right, let me, sorry about that. Now I have Kristen. Okay. Go ahead, please. Good evening, council members. And I am Kristen Brown. I'm a parent here in the community and I am super excited about this program coming up here. I hope it passes. Um, having kids myself, I just really think it would be a great thing for the community. And like you say, job opportunities for these young kids coming up. My son's gonna be 14. So I feel like he could possibly benefit from this as being a future job. So I just think it's wonderful and um, I hope it passes and thanks for your time. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Uh, that would be with Teresa Graham. Let me move permission to talk uh, and allow to talk. Reset the clock, go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the city council. My name is Terry Graham and I'm a longtime uh, resident of Gilroy and I'm also the chair for the Parks and Recreation Commission. And I was really excited also to see that um, the opening of the swimming pool at Christopher High School is being considered. To have a pool open in our, uh, to our Gilroy families gives them a local place to go to have fun and participate in what can be a lifelong healthy activity. And during our hot summer days, it doesn't get much better than having access to an aquatic facility in our own town. So I really look forward to um, something like this happening. I'm a lifelong uh, 
pool person and swimmer. So I think this is a great opportunity for jobs and just um, new activities for our children in Gilroy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker. That would be Matt Gupta. Just give me one moment. Go ahead, please. Matt Gupta, you are now available to speak. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, Adam, thanks a lot for working on a great project. I heard uh, the presentation and uh, a couple of questions I have is the liability part, you know, very, it, the city of Gilroy taking a very, very large responsibility with the whole project. Even the supplier is making quite a bit of money and keeping all the collection that uh, come on their way. We still are responsible for lots of lot of things. Before you approve this project, my humble request to you and other council member and Madam Mayor is, please do not rush to pass the project tonight. I want you to look at the contract, look at the liability, life insurance. In case of incident, blame could be that somebody didn't polish or wax the slide or somebody didn't do this and that. So I believe the way contract is written, what I saw in a couple of minutes, that was very high responsibility on the city. I think we need to look at it again. And other part is Adam, I felt that today you, other than representing the people or citizen of Kilroy, you are representing the supplier. My humble request to you is please, stay on the side of city, do not answer the question for the supplier. So, so don't go for the bad for supplier like I felt you did. So please reconsider the contract, reconsider our liability before approved, then don't rush, maybe approve next meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you. Do we have another speaker? I do not see any uh, raised hands at this time, Madam Mayor. Okay, seeing no other additional audio comments, then I'm going to, approval? well, hang on. We still have uh, one council member has something to, to say. So I need to, to go to that. Closing the public comment, um, council member, oh, your hand is gone. So maybe not, Do you, I'm sorry. Yeah, council, I, was, I thought you had called on me, so I lowered it. Okay, go ahead then, yes. Sure, I, I just have another question for the, um, for the applicant. I'm wondering, can you tell us uh, what kind of wages and benefits you offer your, your staff? Wages and benefits. Well, in looking at the other cities in the area, um, we are going to offer a pay increase more than they are. Um, our employees will be part-time uh, seasonal workers, so there will not be any benefits. Um, wages, um, you know, we're looking at probably 20%, uh, I would say, increase from 20, 2018. From the wages that you looked at and um, that we paid in 2018? Correct. Okay. All right. Um, Adam or Jimmy, do you want to address the, the liability? I mean, I could take a stab at that. It's, it's not changing, right? We're the property owners. We're the ones responsible for, ma for maintenance. So the fact that we're having an operator come in isn't changing our liability. But you guys want to address that? Mayor, I'm going to ask Leanne to jump in. Uh, we spent okay. a considerable amount of time with our pooling authority to evaluate this. This, is, uh, this has to be signed off by a lot of people who are experts in this area. And Leanne can explain that to you. Great. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, so Recreation Manager Adam Hennig and myself uh, discussed this contract numerous times um, as we were working our way through this process. And by, by bringing in an outside contractor to provide this service, we want to ensure that we uh, shift all risk and liability to the contractor. Sorry, Melissa, but that's just the way this works. Um, if you're going to run the program and be in charge of the program and control the pool site and the employees there, then with that comes the, the risk and liability associated with that program. And so in the contract, we have uh, 
um, increased our standard insurance requirements substantially because this is a high risk program. Um, running a pool, uh, there are always situations where accidents can occur, um, you know, with children and we have, we have the activity slide um, and they're gonna be overseeing that and managing that. So with that, um, we, we put substantial insurance requirements in place uh, to protect the city. Um, and the taxpayers of Gilroy so that we can shift that liability to uh, uh, Swan um, if, if a claim were to be filed against the city of Gilroy. Okay. I believe, I believe uh, the coverage level is $10 million. All right, thank you. Council Member Tovar, if you would like to make a motion that you can do that. Yeah, I'd like to uh, move for approval. Uh, second. Okay, so motion was made by Council Member Tovar and seconded by Council Member Armendaris. Sorry. All right, roll call. Council Member Armendaris? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Libro Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes, and that passed unanimously. Oh. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you very right. much. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, Adam. Okay. Item nine. Wait, what happened to item eight? Oh, eight. Public hearings. We have none. Okay. Item nine, unfinished business. This is appointments to our commissions. So where is my tally sheet? Um, all of the interviewing, you know, was done. We have several commissions here. I'm going to go down the line in the order of well, I guess I'll just go alphabetical because that's how it is on my thing here. And what I'm going to ask is that uh, for each commission, one commission at a time, I'll reiterate the number of seats. I'll ask each council member for who it is they want to vote for. And I'm, I want to also say that you, you don't have to vote just because you have to fill seats. So that is up to each one. You know, in some cases, we do not have enough applicants for, for seats. In some cases, we have more but that is up to each individual council member to place somebody, to vote that somebody be placed on a commission or not. And if it leaves us short, then that just means we have to continue recruiting. Okay, so I want to say that much, but do, do what is right by you and in, in your voting. So we're gonna start with arts and culture and we have four applicants for four seats. So you can either name all four or, you know, whatever it is you feel comfortable doing. But I'm going to start with Council Member Armendaris. Would you please name the uh, up to four or all four that you would like to see on the Arts and Culture Commission? Arts and Culture. Gosh, if I could read my own writing. I have um, Camille McCormack. I have Frank. Mm hmm there's only one Frank. That's good. Okay, thank you. Um, Carmine. Yes. And then the last person, last name. Alexandra Purdue. There we go, Alexandra. Okay, so those are the four applicants for the four seats. So you're casting one vote for each. Okay, Council Member Bracco. I'll go with all four of the ones that applied. Thank you, Council Member Hilton. I'm going to go with uh, Camille, Frank, and Alexandra. Okay, Council Member LaRoman Yos. I'll make it easy, all four. Very good. Council Member Marks. You're on you're on mute, Carol. Okay, sorry about that. I'm gonna go with Camille, Alexandra, and Frank. All right. And uh, Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. I'll go with all four. Okay, and I'll go with all four, which means all four are seated on the Arts and Culture Commission. Um, Ty, our city clerk, do, do you want to confirm that right here and now? Um, yes, I do. They all, uh, yeah, they all got a seat, so. Yes. Okay, thank you. Library Commission, <laughs> we have one applicant for one seat. So again, uh, it's up to you as to what to do here. Okay, Council Member Armendaris. Sure, I think we could go with Saeed. Okay, Council Member Bracco. Saeed. Council Member Hilton. Uh, none. Council Member Laroman Yos. Saeed Nushabadi. 
Council Member Marks. None. Council Member Tovar. Saeed. All right, and I will do Saeed. So Saeed is our uh, new library commissioner. All right, Open Government Commission. Now we have two applicants for one seat, neither one interviewed. So Council Member Armendaris. Um, I'd say neither. Okay, Council Member Bracco. I'd say neither either. Council Member Hilton. None. That was a none, right? Correct. Yeah, okay, thank you. Council Member Leromanos. Neither. Council Member Marks. None. Council Member Tovar. Enriquez. Okay. And I was going to say none, but that puts uh, Council, uh, Tia Enriquez on. <laughs> so, right? Not really. Is that uh, no, you, had, you had six no's yeah, and no votes. one one. <laughs> oh, so it can't. Okay, so neither one. I'm sorry. I was looking at it differently. Yes, okay. that is correct. She only got one. And even if I had put it on, that would be two. So that is not a majority. It was just more than the other is how I was looking at it. Mm -hmm. Got, because mm -hmm. I think, isn't that how it is? Whoever yeah. gets the most votes? That's correct. The way, yeah, it's, it's, it's neither because there was six to one. So neither gets she had six yeah she had six yeah. no's right so neither right so it's not that she got one and he got none so she got she got more votes okay all right so that's going to go with an empty seat until yeah we're through again all right parks and rec now here we have one applicant even though we have two seats so similar problem so this is eric arendando so council member armadaris a yes for Eric. Okay, Council Member Bracco. Eric. Council Member Hilton. Eric. Council Member Laromanos. Eric. Council Member Marks. Eric. Council Member Tovar. Eric. All right, myself too. So that's seven votes. So we have one of two filled on Parks and Rec. Okay, Personnel Commission. It's my understanding that Annie Tomasello has withdrawn. Is that Correct. Uh, I didn't hear that. Todd, I didn't hear I'm asking the city clerk. Is that correct? Yes. I uh, let me make confirm with. I think it, uh, Leanne sent me that information just mm -hmm. recently. Yeah, it's okay. It's just I want to make sure. Yes, that is the information I received from uh, Miss Tomasello. Okay. So everybody, you can um, Annie's withdrawn. So that leaves three applicants, one incumbent, a total of three for two seats. Mayor, could you remind us who interviewed? There was a yes, one who interviewed absolutely. Left. Marissa Haro interviewed. Right. Sergio Patterson interviewed. And Nita Eddie Mitchell, who's the incumbent, interviewed. Okay. We had what another one. Yes, we had another one who interviewed, but his address turned out to be outside. Oh, the that's limit. the one. Thank you. Right. So that's what, why you are left with three choices for two seats. Okay. So council member Armendaris, who would your two be? Uh, Marissa Haru and Nita Mitchell. Okay. Council member Bracco. Marissa and Nita. Council member Hilton. Marissa and Nita. Council member Laromanos. Marissa and Nita. Council member Marks. Marissa and Nita. Council member Tovar. Anita and Marissa. <laughs> okay. <it> up there. <laughs> and I'm doing the same. Okay, so they each got seven. So Marissa and Nita Eddie Mitchell are our two new personnel commissioners. And we thank Annie Tomasello, outgoing Annie, mm -hmm. for her service. Okay, planning commission and our last one. So this one is two seats. We had seven applicants four of whom interviewed. And uh, if you want reminders, Anador Kushner interviewed, Adriana Leongart interviewed, David Matuzak interviewed, and Zintis Reeks interviewed. And then we had, you, you see all the other applicants there. Okay, so out of the seven, I need each to pick two if you, if you would appoint two. All right, so Council Member Armendaris. 
Uh, Anadora Kushner and Adriana Leongart. Okay, Council Member Bracco. Anador and Zintas. All right, Council Member Hilton. Anador and Adriana. Council Member Laromanos. Zintas and David. Okay, Council Member Marks. Anador and Adriana. Council Member Tovar. <laughs> You're on mute if you oh, said. Sorry. I'm sorry. Adriana and David. Adriana and David. Okay, and I'm going to go with Anador and Adriana, which means so, uh, Ty, I come up with five for Anador, five for Adriana, two for David, and two for Zintis. Yes, I got the same thing. Okay, so Anador and Adriana then are our new planning commissioners. Okay, thank you, everybody. Right, we are right. done. Done with that. Uh, Madam Mayor? Okay. Yes. Did you still want to take public comment on this? <gasps> public comment on, yeah, okay, sorry. Absolutely, I guess I should have done that before we voted. Yep, is there okay. any public comment on this? I did not receive any written public comments, nor do I see any raised hands. You, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. No, that, I'm sorry that I missed that entirely. Okay. All right. Item 10, 10.1. This is, well, 10, introduction of new business, 10.1. Consent of the appointment of John Biggs as interim community development director, retired annuitant, effective February 8th, 2022, and adoption of a resolution of the city council of the city of Gilroy, approving the exception to the 180 day wait period for John Biggs and approving the interim appointment and employment agreement pursuant to California government code 21221H. And Leanne is going to be telling us all about it. Good evening, mayor and members of the council. Um, as to give you a little bit of background, due to the recent resignation of our community development director just before the holidays, uh, we have a vacancy in this position. And we commenced a recruitment on February 1st uh, to fill this position, but it, as, as with many recruitment processes, especially those at the executive level, it will take some time to uh, go through that selection process. In the meantime, uh, we've been on the lookout for someone who could serve as our interim community development director uh, to provide some assistance and leadership until we can get the position filled. Um, former Los Altos community development director John Biggs and council member Tovar, he's a Gilroy resident, um, <laughs> is able to serve as the interim community development director. Uh, Mr. Biggs is a California Public Employees Retirement System retired annuitant, and he retired at the end of December 2021. He does have the education, skills, and experience to hit the ground running and to serve as our interim community development director starting tomorrow. Um, Mr. Biggs has over 20 years of related municipal work experience. As I mentioned, he was the community development director in Los Altos, and he had held that position for five years. Um, and then prior to Los Altos, Mr. Biggs served at, in the communities of Pismo Beach, Alameda, and Pacific Grove. So he's worked in a variety of different places and will bring that experience and expertise to Gilroy. He has a bachelor's degree in urban planning from San Jose State, and he also has some related certifications. So the CalPERS process is um, kind of complicated and there's certain rules we have to follow if we want to hire a retired annuitant. And it's super important that we carefully follow those regulations, not only to protect the city of Gilroy, but to also protect Mr. Biggs uh, because he retired and he wants to keep his retirement and doesn't want to jeopardize that in any way. So we carefully follow these regulations. So government code section 21221H allows an agency to hire a retired annuitant to serve in an interim position when there is an immediate need for expertise and specialized skills and a recruitment is underway. So we've met that requirement because uh, Mr. Biggs has the expertise, we have the need, and we've already started the recruitment. Um, the retired annuitant cannot work more than 960 hours in a fiscal year and cannot receive any compensation other than the hourly rate of pay 
uh, for the work performed by other employees performing comparable duties. And we've addressed that in the employment agreement. Um, there is a governor's executive order that is currently in place. Um, it's executive order N-12-21. This was put in place uh, due to the COVID crisis and the difficulty that agencies are having in filling positions and keeping up with the workload and the additional workload that we all have to comply with all of the different COVID regulations. And so that um, governor's order does allow in some instances for retirees to go beyond the 960 hours. I'm not anticipating that with Mr. Biggs, but it is there in case it, it would become necessary. And then there were other changes um, when the Pension Reform Act went into place. Um, one of those changes requires re retired annuitants to be separated from employment for at least 180 days before returning to work for an employer that belongs to the same retirement system from which the retiree is receiving a pension. However, Government Code Section 7522.56, are you tracking me with all these government codes? Because <laughs> yeah. there's going to be a test after this, allows the governing body to adopt a 180-day exception resolution certifying the nature of the employment that, and that there's a necessity to uh, fill a critically needed position before the 180 days has passed. We have that immediate need here in Gilroy. Uh, it's a critical need for a community development director. Um, so there is justification to make the exception and waive the 180 day wait period. In addition, the government, the governor's executive order, same one in 12 21 also waives this 180 day wait period uh, due to the COVID crisis that we're currently in. But we want the council to adopt the resolution anyway, in the event the governor's executive order goes away or ends at some point that we'll still have the resolution in place, waiving that 180 day period and complying with all the CalPERS regulations. And then the last one I'll mention um, is that the executive order also suspends the CalPERS requirement that a retired annuitant, annuitant have a bona fide 60 day separation from all CalPERS employment if, they, uh, if the retiree retires before they reach the normal retirement age. This section applies to Mr. Biggs because he has a few different retirement formulas that make up his retirement. And so um, we have to make sure we comply with that as well. Um, but because of the governor's executive order, um, we, the 60 day period is waived. So we wanna give you the insurance that we have gone back through all of these regulations and made sure that, that we're in compliance with, with everything to allow Mr. Biggs to come on board as our interim community development director. Uh, the staff report contains a list of duties uh, that uh, Mr. Biggs will perform in the interim community development director role. I will not uh, go over those with you. They're there. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer those. Um, there is some cost savings because we're when we fill the position on a interim temporary basis, um, we're paying the hourly rate for the position and no benefits. So the benefits is what uh, creates some savings, um, which is noted in the staff report. Um, and so we're asking the uh, council to approve this, um, uh, to ensure continuity in the community development department to consent to the appointment of John Biggs as our interim community development director, effective tomorrow, February 8th, and approve the resolution waiving the 180 day wait period um, and approving the interim appointment under California government code 21221H and authorizing the city administrator to execute the employment agreement. And we can begin the quiz anytime y'all are ready um, on the government code sections, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Leanne. And Mr. Right. Biggs is here and he can uh, tell you about anything about himself that you, uh, you know, more that you want to know about him. Okay, so let me ask council members first if they have any questions of your report, Leanne, and then I'll ask uh, Mr. Biggs if he would like to say anything. Council, yes, council member Armanderas has a question for Leanne. Thank you, uh, thank you, Leanne. Can you tell us again what kind of um, job searches or talent searches going that we're engaged in to fill sure. this position? Yeah, we have uh, secured the services of Avery and Associates, um, who is assisting us in outreach uh, on a nationwide basis to identify a community development director for Gilroy, uh, focus being on California because California has some pretty uh, specific and unique laws and regulations related to the urban planning function. Um, and so, uh, they are working on that recruitment right now, and the closing date is the early part of March. I want to say it's 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 like March fourth 
is the closing date for the position, and then we'll uh, be going through a, a vetting process after that. Thank you. And does PERS um, exclude um, Mr. What's his name? Biggs. Biggs. Mr. Biggs from uh, being part of that search, or does anything suit him? I, I don't think Mr. Biggs has any intention of applying for the position. If if he did, um, he would have to come completely come out of retirement and give up his pension um, and and then become an active participant in the California public retirement system again. Um, yeah, but I'll let him speak for himself in that regard. I think he just retired. I think he's kind of liking it. I, I, I think when we, when we called him, he, he, he kind of paused for just a second and said, wait, I just started. <laughs> Who could blame him? Yeah. But I think because he lives in Gilroy, he wants to help us out. Yeah. Okay, seeing no other hands raised, I'll go, go ahead. John, would you like to say anything since you're here? Sure, thank you very much, Madam Mayor, members uh -huh. of City Council. I'm John Biggs, um, your, your applicant or recommended um, person to fulfill the interim position for community development director position. I have over 32 years of experience working in local government and over 20 years managing a community development department. And Gilroy is a community that I live in and I appreciate uh, very much. And I would like to do my best to help out the community. I look forward to working with all of you and. Uh, city manager Forbes and all staff members in the community to help it move through the, the planning processes. So it's nice, nice to meet you all online and I look forward to meeting you all in person. Thank you. All right, we now have two hands raised. So uh, Council Member Tobar and then Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor. And Mr. Biggs, welcome. As you know, Thank I don't you. think anybody's more happier than me to have somebody from Gilroy. So <laughs> I'm excited. So, um, you know, so welcome. Um, I know that you recently retired. Um, was that from the city of Los Altos or? It, it was from the city of Los Altos through CalPERS, okay. correct. Got it. Okay. Now, just my question was going to be, obviously, have you worked with the city very similar to Gilroy? But since you're a resident of Gilroy, I think you know what we're all about out here. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that. It's, it's, it's hard to be a planner and not pay attention to what's going on in terms of community development planning projects in the, the town that you live in. So... I've been following Gilroy and the happenings on here for quite a while. Thank you. All right, Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so coming from Los Altos, where I've always enjoyed riding, you know, my bike and dining, I, I, I love that atmosphere. I'm curious, how did your approach to staff and in, in the balance of working with developers and writing staff reports so that they included items that don't just focus on cars? I know that's sometimes a thing of planners of the past, but really work to create that balanced transportation network that supports and encourages um, walking, bicycling, and uh, transit ridership. Yeah, um, we have a large segment of the community that does bike and walk all through Los Altos. And so we were very cognizant of that. And we would look to projects to make sure that they accommodated uh, bicyclists and pedestrian needs especially given the, the shared bicycle uh, platform that is, is about. We had the Google bikes that were uh, quite widely used around Los Altos, uh, along with electric bicycles. And we wanted to make sure that the development projects that came through were including amenities that would accommodate electric bikes. It was looking for secure lockers that not only provided a, a secure place to provide a bicycle or store a bicycle, but also had a, a capability for charging the bicycles. Um, and also looking to some of the projects that had underground parking garages uh, with the ramps that led down to the storage areas for the bicycles. We were looking to making sure that the ramp surfaces themselves were accommodating uh, the, the footwear that bicyclists use and making sure that it was appropriate so that there wasn't any uh, slipping hazards or, or traction hazards for getting bicycles into and out of those those parking spaces. And then working with the community, we had Greentown Los Altos that was a big proponent of bicycling and pedestrian uh, access and activity through the community, working closely with them on efforts to encourage bicycle riding and then doing things such as our community events we would have. Um, uh, bicycle valet opportunities where people could ride their bike and put it in a secure location where they could pick it up later after attending an event. So very comprehensive. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, seeing no other hands, I'm gonna go to public comment. 
So for those watching the meeting, now is the time for public comment uh, portion of this agenda item 10.1. Uh, if you are participating in tonight's meeting via Zoom, use the raise your hand feature visible on your screen. If you're calling in, press star nine. So looking to our city clerk, do we have any public comments? I did not receive any uh, written public comments, nor do I see any raised hands at this time. Okay. Mayor, then seeing, for approval. Okay, seeing no additional audio comments, I'm going to close the public hearing and we have a motion. Uh, okay, we have a couple of things here. So first motion, Council Member Tovar, would that be uh, to... Consent, consent of the city administrator's recommendation to appoint John Biggs as interim community development director. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, and we recommend there be two separate votes. Yeah. Right. So is there a second to I'll this? Second. First? Okay. Seconded by Council Member Hilton for this first motion. And roll call. Council Member Armanderas? Yes. Council Member Brocco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. Council Member Lee Romunoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes. All right. That's unanimous. And part two or item B, I need a motion to adopt a resolution of the City Council approving approving the exception to the CalPERS 180 day blah, blah, blah thing. So moved. Okay. Moved by Council Member Leroy Munoz. I'll, I'll second. second. Oh, Carol. Okay. Oh, okay. Seconded by Council Member Marks. Roll call vote. Council Member Armadares? Yes. Council Member Brocco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Council Member Hilton? You are mute, Zach. Aye. Thank you. Council Member Leroy Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes, that's also unanimous. Thank you. Congratulations, if that's the right word. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay, we are moving on to agenda item 10.2 which is the adoption of a resolution of the City Council of the City of Gilroy rescinding resolution 2021-17 and adopting the amended and restated flying flags at city facilities policy. And this is gonna begin with a staff report by Jimmy Forbes. Um, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, I have, do you have a PowerPoint for you this evening? Uh, can you give me a nod that you can see it? I can see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, the item before you is a follow-up to an item that we have discussed over the previous year, and it is the City's Flag Flying Policy Amendment. Uh, the uh, staff has followed Council direction uh, from May 17, 2021, when the original Flag Flying Policy was adopted. Uh, some of those items that were included in the original policy was the commemorative flag, which identifies and honors specific dates, historical events, causes, nations, or groups of people. Um, the, the, the first commemorative flag that the city had flown was the LGBTQ plus uh, pride flag, uh, which was the first uh, flag that the city had flown outside of the traditional flags of sister cities, city emblem, and the United States and state of California flags. Uh, the, at that event, at that time, um, there were discussions by council about the level of city involvement, staff time, and cost uh, for such uh, events. And therefore, uh, in June of 2021, council directed staff to bring back more information about modifying the flag flying policy. In September of 2021, uh, staff returned with sample policies from other cities, and uh, council directed staff to incorporate changes into that policy. Um, that is uh, what we are here to do this evening. And so some of the lists that we had from council uh, was a process of approval annually by the city council, a required application, 150 signatures of Gilroy residents, 18 plus, including their addresses, uh, the requirement of staff to verify the signatures and limit staff to processing application acquiring of the approved flag, raising and lowering the flag, and announcement of the flag flying. Uh, so that would be the uh, limitation of uh, staff involvement. Uh, I mean, your, your, your program is not progressing. Are, are you intending to show the slides? Yes, I am. I, <clears throat> okay, hold on just a second. I'm sorry. Mayor, can I ask Jimmy a quick question while he's doing that? Um, Jimmy, do you want to take a question or would you rather wait till you're done? I can take a question. Yeah, no, okay. no, I just, um, I just, I just want to make sure you, you read sort of what the um, 
the guidelines are, and you said um, uh, Gilroy residents, but do you mean mm -hmm. registered voters or just residents? The, the um, first of all, I want to see, I believe you can see the, the, the slideshow now. Yes, it's it's advanced. Okay, good. And the uh, the really the uh, the way that um, we've identified an opportunity to um, to identify residents is by registered voters. Okay, all right. Just want to make sure. Yeah, so, it's, yeah. Okay. it's actually I, in our charter. We we discovered <laughs> that our charter yeah. says that it, they have to be registered voters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, again, this is what I've uh, read to you so far, uh, and so only one flag flown at a time. And then the policy would take place in effect next calendar year. So this process would kick off approximately in September. Council would review in December and would uh, begin uh, with whatever flags council had voted to fly in January of 2022. Uh, staff would address in the policy any needed waivers or anything missing that needs to be added uh, when we adopt the final policy that would eventually come back to council. Uh, the proposed policy incorporates direction received, and we looked at numerous other cities. Um, I'm sure, as you can imagine, that um, not one uh, city does it exactly the same, uh, but uh, we took some feedback from other communities and those located around us and, and such. Some, some communities do not uh, fly uh, flags other than their city, uh, state, and United States. So. Uh, we took that feedback from council. And so the required annual application period is September through October. And as I mentioned, approved by council via resolution in December, 150 signatures must be registered voters and the registrar of voters will verify signatures. Uh, that will have a cost associated with that. And uh, council has the option of requiring that those costs be included in the application fee. Uh, some communities charge uh, fees for this process, some do not. Again, it's all dependent on the, the will of the council, but we did see both options out there. Uh, the actual processing of the application and acquiring of the flag is uh, would be the limits on the staff time, as would be just raising and lowering the flag at the beginning of ending a month and announcing that the flag is flying. So um, that part of staff time would not be um, would not be a, a great amount. It would be pretty minimal uh, at that level and uh, that um, the policy would also be amended to only have one flag flown at a time, and then the policy would take uh, place upon adoption if Council was to approve um, that this evening. Uh, other policy amendments, uh, application fee would be established to cover cost of staff review of application and preparation of council item. Uh, again, that cost would be minimal uh, uh, just to cover staff time, but again, it, uh, different communities have done it in different ways. Uh, we did have a discussion with council previously about uh, a formal ceremony and council directed uh, that we bring back a policy that the ceremony is hosted in very similar manner in what a special event would be. Uh, so thus a special event permit. So the applicant would host the event themselves. Uh, they would need a permit for the special events, encroachment and facility rental as deemed appropriate by the city. And then any insurance fees for staff time to review application and conditions of approval through established procedures. So uh, we would treat this like we would any other staff, or I'm excuse me, any uh, special event permit on how it gets reviewed and analyzed and approved. And then the approval of the ceremony itself is separate from approval to fly a commemorative flag. Uh, the flag approval does not guarantee the ceremonial approval. So staff in December would approve the flying of the flag, but through staff review and approval process uh, may or may not result in an actual ceremony. It would be dependent on uh, what's proposed by the applicant. Um, the fiscal impact is uh, the application fee would be proposed to offset any cost. Uh, but the specific cost is not known uh, and would vary based on number of applications. If we only receive a few applications, as you can imagine, uh, staff time would be limited, cost would be limited, but if we are inundated with numerous applications, especially when we have numerous ones in the same month, uh, we could be spending a lot of time evaluating those. But again, we don't have enough specifics to know which way this program will go or the amount and involvement to determine um, the specific cost at this time. Uh, so the feedback that we received from Council is incorporated in the recommendations, um, and so uh, Council can uh, modify, edit, or reject, or accept those uh, recommendations. 
after deliberation. But uh, included in this staff report is a uh, recommendation to adopt a resolution that would rescind the previous policy and adopt and amend a restated flag flying uh, at city facilities policy. Uh, so with that, I will conclude my report and answer any questions that, that you may have. Okay, Council Member Marks, I see your hand raised, but can I just go just ask you one thing about the permit, um, special events permit, Jimmy, that was just on your couple slides back. That's only if somebody's wanting to have a, 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 some kind of event that warrants a permit, right? That, I mean, if people are just wanting to gather, that does not require a permit. There's nothing there, right? It's correct? Right. There, there really is a distinction here. Uh, you know, if you, you have a free speech event where you gather at City Hall and and you talk and you you gather that there's really nothing for that. But we're talking more about amplified sound, right. um, an extremely large gathering that may require some type of police right. presence due to the right. volume. Uh, again, uh, yeah, but we, we do not want to um, to demotivate people to show up and exercise their free speech rights. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to make that clear that this isn't saying that just to have people there, you have to have a special event permit. It's just saying if you're going to have a special event, then you need a permit. Yeah, something that qualifies as. Okay, so Council Member Marks, and then I saw Council Member Tovar, and then I see Council Member Armandera. So let's go in that order to start. Council Member Marks. All right, Jimmy, I just have a clarifying question. Does a person have to reapply every year? for the flag flying policy? It, as the way it is written, that would be a requirement. It, 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 and, that, and, and that enables uh, council to annually review what is being proposed if things have changed. Uh, but again, if that is not the desire of council to do that, then uh, that could be a modification of the policy. Okay, thank you. All right, council member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jimmy, in regards to the financial impact, and I understand you're talking about staff time, but here you list, um, staff time for reviewing the application, flying the flag. So I, I mean, when we did the pride flag, it literally took a few seconds to put that up and down. So, I mean, I'm trying to understand there's a cost associated with that. Well, as I described, the cost for doing that only is pretty small. We don't yeah. consider that an impact, uh, yeah. depending on, you know, if there's an event and you wanted staff to uh, wait for a ceremony or anything like right. that, there would be an opportunity cost there. But uh, again, we haven't no. explored what that Thank actual you. And value I, is. And, and, and I ask that we, we be very cautious when we look at cost, because as you know, when we did the pride flight, you know, we had determined that... Um, the sponsoring council would have to pay for, you know, and obviously I paid for all the other stuff that besides the flag and all the other stuff. I just don't want to put it out of somebody's range that, you know, that they can't afford a $500 application fee, but I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just thinking out loud here. I just want us to be very cautious and we're in the cost that we might charge somebody. Um, in regards to the recommendation, I want to go back to a councilwoman Mark's question. So before this policy was presented tonight, as you all know, we had that large uh, heated discussion and uh, regarding the, the pride flag. And it's my understanding, because again, this is a new policy, my understanding that that flag should be grandfathered in, meaning that we don't have to go through this with that, with that flag, that it's, it's gonna be something that happens annually. And it's not lumped into all the other flags that we're, you know, we may be discussing uh, down the road. So I would recommend that we, pull that one aside and grandfather that one and say, you know what, there wasn't a policy back then. We created one for that flag. So there's there's no reason for us to lump it in with the others. That's just sort of my thoughts and, you know, just curious to see what other people say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Council Member Armendariz. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a couple of things and a question. So uh, first I'd like to uh, agree with Council Member Tovar in that um, I'd like us to be uh, very cautious and conscientious of uh, any fees that, um, that we uh, impose, that they not be uh, prohibitively expensive for organizations or people in the community who, who you know, uh, deserve an equal chance to uh, raise the flag or apply for the flag that, that they like to be uh, flown. And then also that uh, since we voted already on the pride flag that 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 flag be before we had a you know a policy that that flag be grandfathered in. I would agree with that. Um, and my question is, um, this is February, the second month of the year. If 
we adopt this new policy and um, end the old policy, what's going to happen in the next 10 months or for the next nine months, right, uh, between now and uh, the initiation of the of the next policy? Well, as Councilmember Armendariz, I'll, I'll answer your questions in, in order. Uh, the fee itself would have to be approved by council. Council approves all fees that we charge. And so if we brought that forward to you as part of the regular fee schedule and you felt that was excessive, uh, council is always able to modify that. We do that for different types of fees. Some we charge 100% recovery, others we don't charge any recovery. So um, that would be up to the will of council. Uh, to answer your second question, uh, the process from, like you say, from March to uh, you know the next year, uh, right now there would not be one in this recommendation because uh, what we want to do is afford everybody the opportunity to be part of the same cycle. And so in order to do that, you have to kind of have a starting and an end time. Now, uh, council could uh, modify our recommendation to change that start and starting time, uh, but we, we put September just as a, as a placeholder uh, in order to enable us to start the calendar year off with the next year's flags. But uh, there is no, um, there's no hard date necessarily required here. And uh, there's, there's just, you know, it's just a matter of time, how you, how you want to do the timing. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. Okay. Council member Bracco. And then I see council member Hilton. Yeah. Um, I want to thank staff. I, I thought it was a pretty good uh, uh, policy and, but I am against um, making different rules for different groups or flags. Um, I, I, I think I would look really bad saying one group gets a special circumstances. Another one, they have to go out and gather signatures and stuff. It would just seem like you're trying to uh, limit uh, who gets to fly a flag at City Hall. And I, I, I think if it was challenged, I don't know how legal that would be. So thank you. All right, thank you. Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to repeat what Council Member Tovar um, has already said too, that the pride flag, we went through that full entire process and I believe that it should be um, grandfathered into it. Um, I do think that this new policy, um, although I was against it initially because I didn't really want to see any change into it, I do think that it, it does bring a more fair approach and a year-long approach. So I, I appreciate that and I'll, I'll support that. Um, and Jimmy, if you could just flag when the fee schedule does come up and where the application is, because that's something important to me as well. And oftentimes if we approve uh, a large amount of fees, I'll probably miss it. Um, cause it's a, definitely a barrier that I want to make sure that, um, that doesn't exist. Thank you. Okay. Council member LaRoe Munoz. Yeah. My, my next, my thought was going to be similar to that. It, Jimmy, I, I just want to confirm, we're going to look at the fees for the application every, every cycle. So every year, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And, and actually Mr. Hilton uh, does bring up a point. The list of fees that we give you are, is voluminous. And so when we, if, if council approves that, um, you know, the recommendation, we can ensure to communicate that fee and highlight it as well, because that's not something we're looking to make money off of, to be honest with you. And uh, we also um, would uh, be very hesitant to have a number out there that prohibits people from uh, applying. So we, we would have to communicate that with council. Yeah, that, that's, what, that's what I took it to to mean as well that it's simply cost recovery, not in any way trying to exclude anybody or gouge anybody for cost. All right, thank you. Okay, I have some comments too, and then we'll go to the public and then come back to see how, how we might wanna go about this. But I wanted to ask um, in our policy, in, in the actual suggested policy that staff has, um, I wanna clarify whether or not we are asking for the applicant to provide the flag, the actual flag, or is the city uh, purchasing the flag? In its current version, we would ask the applicant to provide the, the flag. And the reason why we did make that somewhat change is because then the cost would be borne by the applicant. But in the policy, we do have to review it and ensure that it's consistent size wise and, and appropriate for what the uh, what they're intending to do. Okay, so that that's fine. I just wanted to point that out. And the other thing is, 
displaying of the flags on um, actually in the exhibit A, which would be the policy. It's not clear to me, the policy doesn't say, I mean, it might, we each might think it's clear in our minds where the flag's gonna go, but in the policy, it's not very clear as to where the flags will actually fly. Should the, pol so is that true? Does the policy in fact not specify that this is at city hall or at a city park or what, what city facilities? Yeah, it, it, it's, um, it is not clear. And I would ask council as part of the recommendation, recommendation that staff made to, to make that uh, applicable to city hall only. Uh, we have numerous flagpoles uh, throughout the city and locations, uh, but the only discussion we've had is at Bennett City Hall. So I know. Uh, the two points that you bring up mayor that I would ask that we get clear definition from council is the, um, is the uh, the location at City Hall and then the um, the previous item that we just discussed, which was the okay. Area. So then, like I said before, I go to public comment, and then we'll come back to council. But I want to throw out there that you know specifying the which flagpole, clarifying that uh, who is purchasing the flag. I'd also like to throw out just for consideration, just to think, so that the public hears this too when they comment that possibly one solution to to those who might not want to. Uh, suggest that this be a reapplication every single year, that it could be a reapplication, but for, for example, maybe the 150 signatures are good for two years, you know, so you don't have to go getting those signatures and paying the cost of verifying those signatures. And just so you still have to apply the next year to make sure that you aren't hogging a particular month, for example, you know, whatever it is, but not have the 150 uh, signatures. Okay. All right, so with that, I think, uh, and then I also wanna say too on, on the pride flag, uh, because the majority of this council did support flying that flag, even without a policy in place yet. And I, I am a believer of supporting the majority of the council's vote, then I too see that as something that doesn't need to go through this process. What I don't know what the council would like to do is for how long, like, is that a two year thing too, you know, or a four year thing with council terms or when would you ever want to revisit that? Cause even that flag changes, you know, the actual flag, how it looks. So just things to think about. I want the public to hear all of our potential deliberations before we go into public comment. Okay, so with that, I would like to open the public hearing and say that this is agenda 10, item 10.2, the time for public comment portion on this agenda item. If you are participating in tonight's meeting via Zoom, please use the raise your hand feature visible on your screen, or if you are calling in, press star nine. At this time, I will ask the city clerk whether there are any public comments on this item. Yes, Madam Mayor, there, are, there were three public comments uh, provided uh, uh, to you via email. And I did see you raise hands. Give me one second. I need to get the participant up okay. and running. I see Kat Tucker, Ken Sullivan, and Eric Howard. Uh, Kat Tucker, go ahead, please. Hello. Hello, we can hear you, Kat. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Um, I uh, completely agree with Re. Um, you know, all the research that staff did, and I'm appreciative of the fact that they checked all different cities, and I'm sure there was a lot of variance <laughs> between the different cities. So this seems like a good compromise. I'm very supportive of this policy. What I what I would say, though, is as, as a longtime citizen of Gilroy, but just in general, that I would think that all these flags would not go at City Hall, that I would think that the, uh, like in some of the other cities, just the city, the state and the US flag be at City Hall. However, to designate, I would prefer downtown um, at the Paseo, cause that's the property we own. But if in the future we ever had a plaza like we had hoped for downtown, that because that would be more visible. That would be where everybody drove by. Whoever drives by City Hall that much on 7th Street? I mean, really, the majority of the citizens don't. So um, for those two reasons, I would say that you would please consider that, you know, maybe putting a flagpole downtown somewhere or, or at the Paseo. Uh, and maybe if you don't want to do it tonight, then at least consider that for a future because because really, if we're really going to be proud uh, at all these different organizations, then it should be visible uh, to everyone. And downtown seems 
to me the place. Um, the other thing is, I, uh, you know, I struggle with um, the grandfather in thing. I agree with grandfathering in, but then maybe limited to um, two years because everybody should have the equal um, time of requirements. So maybe, maybe this time the um, the pride flag can can go by for two years and, and not have to do any of the requirements, but then they have to plug in at the next cycle or something like that, because it should be fair for everyone. And, and uh, I don't know what you have thought about, but there's a lot of people, a lot of organizations, and if there's only 12 months in a year and only one per month, I don't know how that's gonna work. So you may have to be able to assign um, two facilities at once, maybe one, if you're gonna go ahead and do it down at the city hall, which I don't agree with, but if you do anyway, then you might have to also ask about Christmas Hill Park as well, because um, you, know, there, you could have 15 or 20 different flags and you have to consider that. Everybody should be treated equally and equally fair. And so, um, I don't know, please consider that. That's it, thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker. That will be Ken Sullivan. Give me one second, please. Mm -hmm. Ken Sullivan, go ahead, please. Kim? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on the topic. Um, I understand this policy could possibly go into effect soon. However, um, I strongly believe that the only flags that need to be flown in our city, as I stressed before, is the American, the state, and our city flag. I believe that all three of these flags are inconclusive to all gender, ethnic group, and religion. Um, I feel that if council decides to move forward by allowing the one group flag to be flown, as discussed um, in this meeting, without being under the new flag policy, in my opinion, um, I believe that it's showing favoritism to that particular group. Um, they should be treated equally as the same rules and regulations with this new policy as the, as the rest of the community members will be going through. They should go through the same process as submitting their flag application. Um, I, I disagree with the grandfathering of, of the flag in. Um, and also I was wondering that after the um, reviewing the policy, I wanted to inquire as to how will the flags be voted in? Is it going to be the majority of the council? Is it just by um, sponsored by a certain council member or is it just picked by the city staff to choose what flags get in um, for each calendar month? That's all I have, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, next speaker. Next speaker will be Eric Howard. Just give me one moment. Eric Howard, go ahead, please. Hello, Mayor Blankley and uh, council members. Um, my, my big concern with this is first off, is it city's role to be flying flags of every different organization? But the main thing is this gonna turn very political. Um, it already has by showing, by what uh, council member Tovar brought up about grandfathering in one organization. Um, what about the uh, thin blue line flag that, that was, they tried to get that in there, but they said, no, hold off because we have a new policy we're gonna do. You know, the, what we did originally, really uh, we did it wrong. So hold off. So why are you grandfathering in one organization and excluding another one that tried to get in there? Um, this is gonna turn very political. It's gonna, it's gonna divide our city more than it's gonna, you know, bring it together. Um, Cause when you have three or four um, applicants for the same month, they're going to all be lobbying council members and they're going to be trying to get their flag flown. And I don't think that's the best use of staff time or council time. It, you know, showing favoritism to certain organizations or groups. You know, this is supposed to be an inclusive town and we have several council members on there that are trying to divide us and it's not right. Yeah, you're right. That's right. Smile. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to say this is going to, this is going to turn very political and you know, if that's what you guys are after, that's what you're getting. And my, another thing, um, you know, how much, Jimmy, can you tell us how much it costs for the registrar of voters to verify 150 signatures? Do we know that? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll take care of responding to what I can later. It's not an interactive. Are you finished, um, Eric? Yeah, that's all I have. 
Okay, thank you. Do we have any other speakers? I do not have any raised hands, Madam Mayor. Okay, seeing no additional audio comments, then I'm going to close the public hearing. And uh, I, I would like to uh, uh, point out a few things that were raised by some of the uh, some of these callers. Uh, one is um, our city clerk said it's somewhere between 46 to 50 cents per signature. So that's not it's not a huge cost. And even if that was passed on to the applicant, it is certainly not prohibit prohibitive. Um, the policy as suggested by staff is and as was approved or requested by the majority of this council for staff to include <clears throat> was one flag at a time. So if you've got four looking for the same month of March, only one of them is going to go. And so to the one caller, it might have been Kat who asked who or somebody else asked, is this how is this going to be approved? It is the council approval. The, sit, the city is just accepting the applications, verifying the signatures, making sure it's all complete, that the fees are paid. Then they bring it before city council as an agenda item, and the council votes on which flag, if any, to raise. And it will only be one flag at a time for a month anywhere. And that's why staff was leaning towards having this be look having the reapplication process every year so that if you had four asking for the same one council gets a chance to acknowledge that and say okay we did this one last year so now this year it's going to be something else but it will always be only one flag at a time so voted by the council one flag at a time the cost was somewhere between 46 and 50 cents a signature to verify and so those are just the things i wanted to answer there Okay, so now Council Member Tovar, your hand is still raised and then it's still discussion here, I hope, because there are sure. certainly a couple things I would like to nail down before we start talking a motion. Yeah, and um, obviously, you know, we can't respond to some of the comments that were made, but um, I appreciate the Gilroy residents who have spoken out and um, I do take their comments um, very seriously. But when we talked about um, being unfair and sort of throwing out some sort of threat or whatever it may be. I think that those are the things that divide our community. Um, when we talked about being fair, so the pride flag, if you recall, Gilroy has been around for 150 years, right? Until last year, no one else sort of brought up a recommendation for a flag. So we, we had many, many years for people to bring up flags and what flags they wanted. When we decided on the pride flag, it was, it was new and we decided to vote on it. And again, I'm okay with the term limit for the pride flag, but I'm, you know, in, in my recommendation, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say what, how many years I think would be fair, but I don't see it as being unfair because again, we gave everybody the same opportunity. Okay. Mr. Howard, uh, again, I, res I, I respect okay. your comments. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Okay. Anyhow, um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, Council Member LaRoman Yost. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So with regard to the grandfathering in of the LGBTQ plus flag, you know, again, it is, it is an issue we on council here, the same composition of council discussed and approved going forward. To me, I would suggest that we grandfather it in for this year. Once we have a process in place, then it will fall under the the process but at, at present it's the only flag that's been approved before this this process was contemplated so i would i would recommend that we grandfather it in for the year and then going forward it would fall under the new process okay thank you council member marks you're on mute still can't hear you i know again okay. I'm Okay, I like what Peter suggested. I think that that's a very good solution for, um, well, for starting this whole procedure. Mm -hmm. um, I think Kat's idea of putting a pole downtown is an excellent idea because now everyone gets to enjoy the flags and everyone gets to see them. So that is a very good possibility. I'm all, I guess it depends on where all of our conversations go right now, but I'm wondering, and this is just a thought, if we, if we can approve some of it tonight and then continue to next month on some of the little details, you know, I don't want to see us jump into formalizing everything without thinking everything through and, um, you know, and then making a mistake later. 
but I do like this policy. I think it's well thought out. I think there's just, you know, a couple of little hiccups that need to be ironed out that we can do. Thank you. Okay. Council member Tovar, you have something else you want to say? And then I've got a few comments okay. too. Uh, uh, this is actually for our city administrator because you've heard several folks saying about displaying stuff downtown. Do we have a policy? I mean, it, and I'm not just talking about flags, I'm talking about anything in general. Do we have policies that prohibit folks from putting things downtown without council approval? Well, I think it depends on what specifically you're talking about. If you're putting it on city land, you're required to have a an encroachment permit. That would yeah. be for anything. For example, I'm talking about, you know, the, the bike racks or uh, the benches or whatever else, the flags, because every fourth of July we put flags out there. So all of that goes through a process, right? If it's on city land, it does. Yes. Yeah. All right. I just, I just wanted, I just want to follow up. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other hands raised, so I'm going to go back to the kind of the little comments that I made. I'm, I, I personally do not. Uh, sorry, Council Member Marks. I don't support uh, this coming back again. This is our third time right addressing this, and I think that the council can always change stuff in the future. If we ever do get a flagpole downtown, we can certainly switch to make that be the place of display. You know, not here, but for now, we have the facilities that we have. I would like to suggest, and I, 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 I might even go ahead and, and make the motion myself, that we approve the policy as, as is um, suggested by staff, that we you that we have the application be every year, but only every other year has to have the 150 signatures if it's for the same flag. And I like council member Laromagnosa's suggestion. I think that's a very good compromise to grandfather in the pride flag for this year so it can fly in June and then have it go through the process. Again, it would only like all the others collect signatures once every other year so that the application period happens every time, but you don't have to go getting all those signatures every time. And that way the council has the opportunity. And then I'd, I'd also like us to, uh, to tighten up whether or not the city is purchasing the flag and that is not a big, big expense. So it's not about the expense, it's about should the city be purchasing the flag or should the organization purchase the flag with the city's approval and that we specify that this is at city hall to, to start um, as as uh, Jimmy suggested. Does that have a second to start? I'll, I'll second that, Mayor. Okay, so that's a motion and a second. Because that's a lot of information, I'm happy if anybody's got uh, questions or something they want to say, now would be the time. Wow, none, okay. That means we want to do a roll call. Oh, sorry, I can't see your hand. Okay, you're on. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. do you want me to go first? I know Dion's up. I couldn't get my. Oh, own. I didn't even see his okay. hand. Sorry. Okay. Um. Okay. Do you want to add in there how the flag would be selected, whether it's council selecting or a committee? Because it's not in there, correct? No. What's in there is that what's in the policy is that the applicant will provide an image the, or, or actually what's in there. No, that's not what I'm asking. If you have two or three flags on a certain month, oh, do council. you have the selection? You might want to add that to your motion because we don't have that in right now, do we? Well, what we have in there is only one flag at a time. So but council would have to choose. It? Okay, but does it stay to the policy that council has to choose? If it doesn't, you might want to add that to your motion. Okay. Yeah, I have no objection to that. I just think that's already said by the it's fact already, that it's already, it's, right. it's already in the policy. It says it, it is? In, okay, uh, all right. The bottom of page 163 of the packet oh. says that okay. council and its sole discretion shall consider the applications and render a decision. Okay. So I, I, it will come to the council every year though. Okay. Okay. Uh, council member Bracco. Yes, Madam Mayor. I, I believe the applicant should supply the flag um, for, just for the reason that the city doesn't need another uh, responsibility of storing flags for everybody for the year. And this way, the applicant can bring a flag every year. And I think it just avoids a lot of problems. 
of you know lost flags and, and this kind of thing. And uh, the motion, as you stated, I could support that. Okay, great. Yeah, I think the 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 back and forth of who who buys the flag again is not about cost. It was more about making sure you know it's in good shape and respectable looking. You know, not frayed, not discolored, not yeah. You know that sort of thing, but okay. So we'll leave it. The, that's the way staff has, has it right now. Is that the applicant will provide the flag, and of course, it still has to meet the criteria that's there in the report, and council has to approve it. But all right. Well, then I think we're ready for a, a vote. Okay, council. Marie, can we? Yeah, I'm. I just Sorry. I want to hear your your suggestions again. There's a lot of in the motion again. Yeah, I want to hear your motion again, please. The, the, sure. The motion was to approve the flag policy as, as stated by staff, um, except to fly the pride flag this year, to have the application process as states in the staff report be required every year, including the pride flag when it comes up next, not this year, but when it comes up next, but to not have the same application for the same flag have to collect the 150 signatures every year, that would be every other year. Right. And we just further specified that we were gonna leave that the organization purchased the flag and that we are, the flags be displayed. So this would need to be added into the policy because the policy right now is not clear that the flags would be displayed for now anyway, at city hall, uh, only at, just on the one pole, one flag per month. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I ask a follow-up question? Okay. So, um, I just want clarification. So, so the flag, we would have to approve whatever flag it is every year, but if it's the same flag, we only have to get 150 signatures the first year, right? No, every other year. Right. So, so, so for example, if whatever flag, um, you know, somebody proposes it, it's approved. So in reality, it shouldn't be up for two years. That's what I'm asking. I think I, yeah. I, so I an application, right? That's okay. Be, and if somebody really, else wants to explain it better, I mean, Jimmy, I mean, or or even Andy, right. my understanding of the motion that I am saying is is actually this. What I read in the staff report, all I'm saying is that instead of having to get the 150 signatures every year, that that alone be every other year, as long as the application is for is no change, is the same flag, right? But no, I just, yeah, no, I, I, I get that. Not so approval, I, not approval, but the 150 signatures for application. That you don't have to go through that right. trouble. You don't have to do the, the city's not do the verification of it. The applicant doesn't right. have to pay for it. Right. right. So it's right. So, so I think it, it goes to what my question was. So we would only have to, let's just say I wanted a, a fly fly for two years. I would only have to get the 150 signatures the first year. And yeah, let's say it's the thin, the thin line flag, for example, because that's right. one we all just got comments on. Sure. Let's say that there's an application for that that comes in September. And let's say that all of the criteria is met. And so staff puts that on our agenda for December. And so we, we the, it takes a majority of the council to approve flying that flag. Right. If the council approves that for the month of July, or whatever the month would be for that, mm -hmm. then that same organization, that same applicant would have to resubmit an application the next September, but would not have to get the 150 signatures in order for the council to approve its right. flying again the following year. It would right. still go before the city council. Every, right. every year, there's the period, the September through October, right. and the city council has to say yay, because we might get applications for a different flag for the same month, and that's where we have to then decide and we're trying to make this something that doesn't become its own project because obviously city has business to take care of. And this is not supposed to be all consuming, but we don't know where this is going to go. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I did. So, and I was going to ask right. if you want, if you would make an amendment, you know, to have whatever flag we fly, we give it a two year time limit. So every, every two years that flag will fly. And in two years, every election cycle, obviously every two years, <clears> we <throat> re-vote on the flag instead right. of every year. Well, but. Now, my suggestion was that they have to reapply every year, but save them the effort of the signatures, because that's really the only effort that there is. Everything else is just writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. So th that's the motion. It's, it's been seconded. So it's, uh, I think we should take a vote. Okay. Council Member Amadeiris? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Aye. 
Council Member Lira Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blinkley? Yes. That's unanimous. Great. Okay. Next item is 10.3. Resolution to approve four hour limited term parking at San Ysidro Park. And Gary, there, oh, there you are. Gary Heap is giving us this report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Let me start by putting the presentation up. Okay. Let's see here if you can go ahead and see this and share that. You guys see that okay? There yeah. it is. Very good. All right, let me start the presentation here. So good evening. This evening I have a presentation for you regarding the request for a signage for four-hour limited term parking at San Ysidro Park. City staff has worked with the neighborhood uh, and the neighbors of San Ysidro Park, uh, specifically the San Ysidro Nueva Vida group, to develop effective traffic and parking safety measures for the area. Uh, this parking issue is one of the issues that is of concern to the neighborhood, uh, and it really has to do with uh, parking along that frontage of the park, both on Lewis and on Murray, uh, which is currently being used as long-term parking by the adjacent residents, uh, which doesn't allow for the park users to go ahead and use uh, the parking along that park frontage. Uh, after discussions, it was determined that four-hour parking would meet the needs of the park users, uh, and that four-hour parking would be uh, recommended again both along both frontages, Lewis and Murray, uh, and is supported by the Commission and the Nueva uh, Vida area. Uh, opening up this area would increase the available on-street parking for the park users and also accommodate the newly increased parking demand uh, due to the new Family Resource Center that is opening in the park. Here's a photo or an or a, um, aerial view of the park itself. The red is the area that we are looking to recommend the four-hour parking. It is not along the residential frontage, just the park frontage on both Murray and on Lewis Street. Uh, it would affect about 39 parking spaces in total, and the signage would read four-hour parking. Monday through Friday between the hours of 7 a.m. and 11 p.m. Uh, this would go ahead and allow the residents to park and use uh, that parking uh, during times when the park is not open. Uh, and the PD will enforce the parking restrictions once those signs are installed. Section 1569 of our Gilroy Municipal Code requires a resolution of the City Council to install signs to regulate on-street parking times. And this is the language from that code section uh, specifically, which gives you the authority uh, by resolution to install those signs. So with that, staff is recommending approval of a resolution to approve this four-hour limited term parking along Murray Avenue and Lewis Street, uh, fronting San Ysidro Park. And that concludes my presentation. All right, thank you, Gary. All right, council, questions of Gary? I just, one quick one, Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. Gary, can you expand a little bit on, on the safety concerns and, and why we would want to, uh, to have the four hour limit there from the purpose of safety? There were several issues in the area that were brought up due to say that were safety types of issues um, that were brought up by the neighborhood. This is more of a parking and a park usage type of, of issue that was brought up. Some of the safety issues were around speeding vehicles, the need for traffic calming, those types of things, which staff is working on. We'll be bringing that back to council at a later time. But this is something that was quick. It was easy for us to go ahead and uh, hopefully bring for approval. Uh, purchase the signs and then install them out there along the park frontage relatively quickly. Okay, so th this doesn't specifically address questions of or concerns of safety? No, just the, uh, to open up the availability of parking for the park users along the park frontage. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Council Member Armendariz. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Thank you, Gary, too, for uh, your work on this and for staff's work on this. I know it's been a big issue. Um, in working with the folks at Nueva Vida and at the park, um, you know, especially now with all the COVID services that have been provided there uh, by the county and city's partnership. I know it's been really hard for folks, um, staff and residents who, who wanna use those services to find parking, right? Many find themselves parking really far away or illegally parking in residential, you know, in the apartment complexes and things like that. So I think this is a good um, compromise um, and, um, Good for the neighborhood, good for the park. But I, I do have a question. Um, 
do we have this kind of restriction at other parks, uh, particularly neighborhood parks? Not that I am familiar with at this point. I think this might be the first time we're uh, putting in this type of parking. Um, but if, if anybody does know of any out there, please let me know. This this is the only one I'm aware of, though. Mm -hmm. It does. Is there parking problems like this at other at other parks? So there could be, but this is the first that I've heard of, and this is the only one uh, that's been brought to our attention at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have I have some questions and comments too. Most well. This, I think this is the only park that has quite a row of parking yeah. that is not meant for residential, but that residents, residences use for not just overnight parking, but they leave cars there. I mean, I'm lucky to have a cousin who lives on Lewis Street. Otherwise, all the events that I go to out there, I would not have any place to park if I couldn't use his driveway. So it's, it's very, very difficult. And that's on Lewis, let alone um, on Murray. So it is a problem. And I know that uh, some, some of the families are, when I've been out there for events have said, you know, think about all the equipment that a family, I mean, I haven't had little kids in a long time, but it's a lot of equipment that comes with little kids with your strollers and your, the stuff that you bring. And when you're making families like that have to walk so far because the parking spaces are being taken by, by people who are just in some cases, you know, using that, that, like I said, for days, they're just trying to keep track of the 72 hour limit. That's all they're doing. So I'm in full support of this. I think it's long overdue. What I'm worried about is the enforcement because that's an issue we have even downtown. You know, we have two hour limits everywhere and we, we have trouble enforcing our parking everywhere. So what I would like to know is, is this going to be a tow away zone too? If you are ticketed and your car isn't moved, is it subject to being towed? Or is that, are we not that far in what this process will be? Do you know? That is, that is a good question typically. And I, and I don't know if we have somebody from our police department who is here, um, but typically if there is a vehicle that is there for a longer period of time, it, it is subject to tow, I believe. So we that what we're being asked to approve tonight is just to put up signs just to put up signs for our parking. It's it's something that is, uh, our code uh, requires a resolution of council to put parking time limits on for on-street parking. Okay, and the enforcement of it or whether or not it's a tow away zone is a separate a separate thing? We've talked to the police department. The police department has said they will would go ahead and um, enforce, uh, but I did not ask them if that enforcement included towing, just the citation if somebody exceeded the four hours. Mm -hmm. Okay, Councilmember Armideris and then Councilmember Bracco. Thank you. Mayor, in, in thinking about this, I'm, um, I think in the name of fairness and because so many um, community uh, residents in the area have relied on that parking for a while, fair or unfair, they, they do rely on that parking. Um, and, and parking is, a, is an issue in that area. It's a high, you know, high density uh, residence. Um, can we offer a, a grace period or kind of like a, a warning system for folks to get, for the police department to issue first a warning and then a ticket um, so that folks get used to the fact that they can't park there over four hours anymore? And also because there might be a language barrier. I, I, Jimmy, yeah, do you want to speak to that? Because I imagine that goes without saying. Do we not do that? Actually, uh, Ms. Armanderas, that's our preference. Um, issuing tickets is not fun for the police department. We don't make revenue off of it. So we would prefer compliance first. And I, I agree with you. We can give people notice, put up some signs and let them know that what they've done in the past, they can't do going forward. And then enforcement would be our last last choice. Okay, Thank, that sounds great. Thank you, Jim. If I may, we are also gonna be providing public outreach to the adjacent residences if approved this evening and letting them know. So we will be doing an outreach campaign. Excellent, thank you. Okay, Council Member Bracco, and then I see Council Member Tovar. Yes, Madam Mayor, um, just so you know, the police department just doesn't drive up and tow people's cars away, uh, you know, for no reason. The only way they tow them away is if there's the car vehicles wanted or something. And if they do tow vehicles away because of registration <laughs> and stuff, they, they put a notice on it. It's usually 36 to 72 hours they give them. And our police department gives it to them over and over and over again. So that's not something you need to worry, that you would have to worry about. All right, thank you. Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. Gary, again, thank you for bringing this forward. I'm, I'm in support of it. And thank you for the questions that um, Councilwoman Armadares brought up. 
um, and the outreach that you say you guys are going to do. When we put up the signs again, um, will they both will they be both in English and Spanish? Because obviously there's a lot of um, you know people from outside of Gilroy that may not get that warning. Um, you know, that are Spanish speaking that utilize that part. So I want to just make sure it's in uh, the language that they'll be able to understand or read. Was that a question or a statement? Yeah. Sir? Yeah, I want to know if we're going to have it in English or Spanish. <laughs> Typically, Spanish. When, when traffic signs are put up or parking signs, they're done in English. That's the standard convention. Uh, when we do the outreach, it will be in English and Spanish. And I could see us uh, putting out some A-frames in advance. And certainly when the new signs go up uh, with language, both in English and Spanish, notifying uh, the users of the park of those parking changes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we all know the you know how active Nueva Vida is in that area, and so they're going to be very that that communication system always amazes me. How are they just it's it's down. They just got it. They're very organized, and so I just can't imagine after a period of time where people now see because understandably when you've let something go for so long, you need to give them time to realize. Oh, now we're going to make it. You know, <laughs> now we're going to say it's limited. Yeah, understood. Okay, so I'm going to go to public comment. All right, um, now's the time for anyone in the public who would like to speak on agenda item 10.3. If you're participating in tonight's meeting via Zoom, please use the raise your hand feature visible on your screen, or if you are calling in, press star nine. Uh, Ty, do we have any public comments? No written public comments, ma'am, but I do see one raised hand. Jorge Mendoza, give me one second, please. Aha. <laughs> Jorge Mendoza, uh, go ahead, please. Okay, gracias. <clears throat> bueno, mi nombre es Jorge Mendoza, y sí quiero agradecer al, al comité que se preocupó por ayudarnos uh, en lo del estacionamiento y al concilio por su apoyo. Uh, realmente, sí tenemos muchísima gente que visita nuestro parque y aprovecha de nuestros talleres y las actividades que hacemos para las familias, incluyendo los niños. Y por el momento, lo más importante, las pruebas de COVID. Y es por eso que sí necesitamos poner límite en nuestro estacionamiento para que más familias aprovechen de nuestros servicios. Muchísimas gracias. OK, thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Le Roman Yost, do you want to translate for us? <laughs> That's what... Yeah, uh, he was thanking us for looking at the issue one of the biggest issues for the families in the area uh, is that of, um, uh, of the parking and, and, and COVID, but with regard to the parking, he is in support of that. So thank you for, um, for the comment, sir. Okay, yes, thank you, Mark. He speaks darn good English too, so, okay. <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, okay, so approval. back to, okay, yeah, back, wait, let me, so are there, are there any other comments, Ty? I do not see any raised hands at okay, this Okay, so seeing no additional audio comments, the public comment is now closed. So Council Member Tobar, go ahead. I'll make a motion for approval with all the sort of um, extras that Gary spoke about, the outreach and uh, the signage and all that. Okay. I'll and I'll second. Okay, I think I heard Council Member Armendaris first. So it's a motion made by Council Member Tobar, seconded by Council Member Armendaris. And go ahead and do a roll call. Council Member Armendaris? Yes. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Aye. Councilmember Lidro Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes. All right. That passes unanimously. Okay. Item 11 City Administrators Reports, Citywide Fiber Optic Project Update. Okay. Actually, Mayor, I want to give one additional report very quickly. Uh, February 24th, I'll be conducting a QA session. A town hall meeting with residents in English and Spanish. And so for an hour or an hour and a half or so, I'll take any question any resident has. Uh, and we'll have some city staff support as well to, um, to discuss that with residents. Uh, I won't have an agenda. I won't have, it'll basically, we'll just start off and see where people uh, want to talk about and what they're, they're curious about. And we'll try to do that about once every quarter. And uh, we get a lot, a lot, get a lot of our best ideas out of those kinds of sessions. So I'm um, looking forward to that again on February 24th. And we'll have some uh, messaging out for that pretty soon. What time uh, of day? I'm sorry. What time of day will you be doing that? 
It'll begin at six. And it's just a general town hall, like open mm -hmm. agenda? Any, anything anybody wants to talk about. And uh, we'll have translation. So uh, I, my Spanish is not near as good as Jorge's English is. So um, I'm going <laughs> I know. to. That's how I feel too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so the second uh, agendized item we have tonight is the fiber optic project that's going on throughout the city. Uh, we do get a lot of calls about this and a lot of them are, are quite legitimate in their concerns and we've worked pretty hard to try to communicate with this provider uh, about parking and disruptions to businesses and things like that, but it's not always successful. Uh, so th this is one of those situations where you have to pardon their dust, but I, I did want Daryl uh, Jordan, our public works director, talk a little about this project, how long it's going in ways that I know he has tried to get our vendor to be a little more um, communicate, you know, communicate a little better with our businesses and our residents. And so uh, he'll give you just a real brief update and answer any questions you have. So uh, Daryl, let me, oh, there you are, Daryl. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, uh, City Manager Forbes. Good, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, anybody who lives in city limits has definitely noticed the large fiber optic construction projects going throughout town. You've seen the traffic control. You, as Jimmy said, you've seen the dust. Uh, you've seen some minor potholes or some issues with some of the paving issues, um, parking issues. We're out constantly trying to fix those. Just to kind of give you a little bit of background, um, we've uh, approved dozens of encroachment permits throughout the entire city. Uh, three different contractors actually at one time have been putting in fiber optic throughout town, miles of actually fiber optic in our town. And uh, the project consists of uh, a, a couple different types of work they're doing out there. Some of you may be familiar with um, some direct boring type of construction methods where they'll actually bore underneath the roads and pop up on the other side um, and they'll they'll have large holes on either side of the street that they have to uh, uh, provide safety for then they have to come back with a, a pavement uh, to go back over those areas that they've disrupted sometimes it's temporary pavement it's not smooth our residents will sometimes run over that and have issues with some little rocks popping up or just not as smooth as they'd like it to be Typically, they come in with a temporary patch like that, and they'll come back with a, a, a more permanent patch later with a, a what we call a hot patch, hot mix that comes in there and makes it smooth out and it rides real nice for the community. Um, but you will see issues like that. Um, specifically, what this project will do is it's going to uh, increase our bandwidth throughout our community, which is sorely needed. These large pipelines are going to allow internet access throughout our community to run much faster, much more information can go around. Uh, for example, our potential uh, uh, new uh, Amazon data center would be connected to one of these large pipelines. Uh, and well, the rest of the community is going to benefit from that as well. Another uh, uh, positive issue is that emergency 911 infrastructure is going to be included as well. So we'll have even better redundancy in our um, police and fire throughout town. So that's going to be a positive issue as well. They're also stubbing out to some residential areas and some commercial areas that currently don't have fiber connections now. So they're pretty slow. Uh, have some uh, interruption issues throughout town. This is going to enhance that as well. So it's a great enhancement for the city. Um, when they're done, it's going to be fantastic. There's a few um, issues that they still have to take care of. The Union Pacific Railroad, they're, they're trying to bore underneath the railroad tracks. And if any of you have ever dealt with the railroad, it's like dealing with God at times. It's pretty difficult. So uh, they're running through that permit process right now. We hope that they'll get through that within the next couple of months. Um, so it looks like potentially we can be done with this project as far as the undergrounding sometime this summer is what we're looking at. They're about 80% complete at the moment, um, but uh, that's currently where we're at right now. Again, as, as Jimmy said, we're running around town with uh, our inspectors, a few ones that we have, trying to keep them out of the roadway, trying to keep the parking spaces open and not to impact our city businesses, especially down the Monterey Street or down some of our a gourmet alley issues. So um, we're scrambling with them to try to keep uh, uh, our streets and roads open and keep the uh, the dust down as best we can. But uh, other than that, I'm here to answer any questions you guys may have. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go. So in a row, I've got Council Member Armandaris, Tovar and Hilton. So Council Member Armandaris, you wanna go first? Thank you. Uh, Daryl, Thank you for your work on this. And can you tell me if areas like um, over at the Luchessa camp where we saw blackouts and, and students not being able to connect um, to the internet, like blackout areas, will those areas be uh, part of this new and improved uh, system? 
or network? I'm not sure if the exact connection is at that location, but however, the whole system itself, the backbone of the system will be able to handle a much larger volume of data than it can now. I mean, 10 to 20 times or even more than that now. So it will enhance it. If not directly, it will enhance it indirectly, I guarantee you. Okay. So we don't know about the areas on the, like on the fringe of our city limits. If, if you have any specific locations that you want me to check, since we have literally um, 40, 50 locations here that they're, yeah. they're running. I can definitely look those for you on an individual basis and get back to you. If, please uh, you. reach out to me on that. Yeah. Okay. I sure will. Thanks. You bet. Okay. Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. No question. Just as comment, I just want to thank Daryl and Jimmy. I know um, it's been a big issue with the parking on 6th Street. And I thank you both for sort of handling that and trying to make it as easy on our uh, business owners as possible. So thank you for the work you did. You're welcome. All right, Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Daryl, the only uh, couple of questions I have is, so you're saying they were doing boring. Did they put the fiber in at the same time or in those streets that they've bored, can we expect them to come back and start putting in the fiber? The fiber should be in the conduits already. However, they've got to connect them all at a certain point and make sure they're all, the connectivity is there throughout the system. So I'm not sure if they'll be back, they may be. Thank you. Um, and also when you're talking about like how systems are going to be better and stuff. Um, so you're saying that these specific companies, like obviously you would have to subscribe to that service, right? I mean, this doesn't just give an overall boost to, I, I think that was a little too general. Sure. Uh, sure. Statement to say. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I think that, that's a great statement. It basically, they're creating a larger highway. Let's put it that way. A lot more cars, a lot more vehicles, a lot more internet service can now flow if you sign up for that particular car, uh, carrier and they're connected to whether you're with Amazon or, or Google or whoever that is, we'll probably utilize all these as well. So I have one final question. Yeah. Um, and it might be more of a historical question. Has, has the city of Gilroy ever looked into creating its own municipal service for, for the internet? Like, would we be able to go inside here and, and, you know, run through uh, their system since they're using our ground, if you will? That's, that's a great question. I do know we do have some blank conduit in the ground already, um, Councilman Hilton, that uh, we could utilize and pull our own fiber at certain areas, whether there's room in these conduits to where we could share. Um, I haven't asked that question. I'd be glad to do so if you'd like me to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, question I would like to ask is just for those watching and hearing again, I look at this as a little bit like having patience with First Street. You know, that we needed all that. We improved our sewer lines and water lines and it took forever and it was hugely inconvenient, but it is all done now and, and thank goodness. This has made its way throughout, I think all parts of the city, at least as far as I know. And I know that, you know, we all, we all uh, stumble every day over our own neighborhoods when I'm out walking my dogs. How long can people expect? Because like out where I live, they they laid the fiber months ago, like it was August, September. When will they come back to do that hot seal? Because some of those places are so, it's almost like a ditch that you have to drive over and slowly. Right, absolutely. Um, again, the major issue right now is crossing the railroad tracks. As soon as they get that done, they should be able to come back and uh, hot seal the rest of all the issues that you're talking about throughout town. So we're looking at the summer is the goal for them to finish that. Okay, so they will circle back throughout the whole city. Right, we, we've That's got the them contracted and their encroachment permits to take care of that. Otherwise, uh, we have it, issues where we can make sure that that happens. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Anybody else with questions? No, okay. Uh, city attorney's reports. Uh, no report. All right. Then with that, sessions. yeah. So we will, do you read first or do I adjourn to closed session? No, let me, let me read them first because we're in open session. So we want to announce them in open session and also okay. see, uh, it doesn't say any agenda. We want to ask if there's any comment on the closed sessions as well. So we'll have to do that after I announce them. Okay. So first, there are two closed sessions that are both conference with real property negotiators pursuant to uh, government code section 54956.8 and Gilroy code section 17A8, 17A.882. The first is the Gilroy Sports Park, 5925 Monterey Frontage Road with the APNs given on the agenda. 
Negotiator is Jimmy Forbes. The other party to negotiation is Sharks Sports and Entertainment LLC. Under negotiations are price and in terms of a possible agreement. The second one is 10th Street Bridge with the APNs given on the uh, agenda. Thomas Luchessa Bridge with APNs and New Fire Station with APNs. Negotiator is Jimmy Forbes. The other party is the Glen Loma Corporation, John Felice, and negotiating price in terms of payment regarding purchase and sale. So the first thing to do is ask for public comment, if there is any. All right, do we have any public comment? I did not receive any written public comments, but I do receive did receive uh, one raised hand here. Give me okay. one second. Yes. Kat Tucker, go ahead, please. <laughs> Hi, now that you have me, I'm listening to everything. I, I find it quite different. I just want to tell you, Andy, being on this side of listening to the closed session items is really not clear. So um, my question, <laughs> I know it's legal. I'm just saying it's not clear to the person who's reading it and or listening. Um, what exactly is going on? Oh, you're saying it's negotiation of purchase of, of land for um, Glen Loma. It's not clear. Are you buying, is a city buying the land or is Glen Loma buying the land from the city? And I guess that would be my question. And uh, of all those parcels that is listed on the agenda, who's buying what? That's my question. Thank you. And I think the answer, Kat, thank, thank you for the question. It, the answer is that that's the subject of the closed session will be the relationship with Glen Loma with respect to these lands and possible purchase and sale. So there's, there's no more information than that, that that's public at this point. Okay, any other comments? I do not see any raised hands, Madam Mayor. Okay, then closing that uh, uh, public comment period and I will then adjourn, it is 8.57. And I am adjourning to closed session. Why don't we take a, gosh, um, let's come back at 9.05. Is that all right? And, and, and the first item meeting, in closed right? session will be take, to take a vote to remain in closed session. So we'll have to do that once we get into closed session. Okay, I'm sorry, Councilman Barmanderas, what was that? We have to log out of this uh, list. Yes, everybody, Barman. right. You got a separate Zoom link. So we log out of this and log into the other and let's reconvene in closed session and we'll take a vote then, like Andy said, at 9.05, please, okay? Got it. All right. <laughs>